a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old time radio. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We We offer offer you... you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to an early California gold camp. And an exciting tale of frontier revenge, as Les Crutchfield tells it in his colorful story, The Pistol. San Francisco Bay was a graveyard that summer. With over 300 deserted windjammers lying at anchor, and the city itself the next step to a ghost town. Every man who could walk, run, or stagger had headed inland to look for gold. And the women had followed. Mostly they traveled up the river as far as Sacramento and fanned out into the hills. That was the jumping off place. Sacramento. Boys, move up close. Everybody sees and everybody gets a chance. Anytime old Honest Faraday runs an auction, you know it's on the level. All right, now, friends. The pistol I'm holding in my hand here is the first one of its kind ever seen west of the Rockies. The first model of Dr. Samuel Coates' new 44 caliber six-shooter. The gun that fires six times without reloading. Now, who'll open her up with a bit of $250? Did you hear me? $250. Come on, boys. There's plenty of gold on the Sacramento River, but only one Coates six-shooter. Now, did I hear a bit of the... $250! Thank you, sir. The man says $250. All right, here we I go. I stood there in the hot sun on the Sacramento waterfront and watch the crowd bidding for the pistol. Roustabouts, gamblers, vaqueros, gold miners, men from everywhere and from nowhere. And a few women. I wanted that gun myself. I wanted it bad. I was taking a stagecoach to Rawhide Flats in the morning where my brother Dave and his partner had located a rich claim. And I didn't plan to load myself down with an outfit. But a gun was different. I was packing a thousand dollars in gold eagles. And I was ready to lay out a good part of it to get that six-shooter. The bidding reached $500. All right, anybody else? Anybody making 550? Five and a quarter, five and a quarter. Anybody else? All right, going once, going twice. $600. $600. And a new bidder. I have $600. Just from here, bid $600. Will anybody make it six and a quarter? Six and a quarter. Only six. $700. And another new bidder. And the little lady knows a bargain when she sees one. All right, I'm bid 700 seven, seven, seven. Will anybody make it eight? How about you, Mr. Fuller, of the bid six? Would you want to raise it again, sir? Sorry, mister. Six was my limit. Let her have it. All right, anybody else? Going once? Going twice? So. Lady, you bought yourself a gun. Now, friends, if you'll step right over here. Could I get through? Pardon me, please. Well, congratulations. What? Oh, you should have kept on bidding. Why? You'd have gone to a thousand dollars if you had to. Yes, I suppose I would. I guess it just isn't your lucky day. Oh, I don't know. Haven't I just met the prettiest girl in California? Have you? Haven't I? Maybe that's not as lucky as you think. I climbed on board the stagecoach to Rawhide Flats the next morning. I found seven trunks that had already been loaded. Five tied on the back and top and two inside. And a few minutes later, their owner showed up. Oh, it was the red-headed gal who bought the gun the afternoon before. It took five miles out of Sacramento to break the ice. And after that... Well, I learned her name was Teresa Blake. She'd been down to San Francisco to buy some new clothes. And she was on her way back to Rawhide Flat. No. No, I don't live with my folks. I don't have any folks. I I work. Oh? Doing what? I'm a singer. The Brass Nugget Saloon. I see. No wonder you wanted a gun so bad. No, I never have any trouble there. 
I got the pistol as a present for my boss, Mr. Mallory. $700 makes a pretty expensive present, Miss Blake. He's been good to me. Awfully good. I see. Well, anyway, it's a great gun. In 15 years, every man west of St. Louis will be packing one. Oh, I was going to give you something I almost forgot. A sort of consolation prize for losing out on the gun. Oh, here it is. Yeah, it looks like a little gold nugget. Brass, not gold. To hang on a watch chain. Souvenir of the Brass Nugget Saloon. Of course, you can pretend it's real gold if you like. All right, I will then. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not what my young brother's doing on the Boston Pocket Claim of his. I mean, pretending it's real. The Boston Pocket Claim? Uh-huh. You said your name was Storm. That's right. Jonathan Storm. I didn't even recognize it. Then you're Dave Storm's brother. Yeah. Do you know him? Yes. Yes, I... Mr. Storm, I wonder if you'd mind if I tried to get some sleep now. I'm, I'm really awfully tired. Around the middle of the afternoon, our stagecoach dropped out of the rough hills we've been traveling through. Ran down into a comparatively level gulf, splashed across the ford in the creek below town, and swung into the wagon-rutted main street of Rawhide Flats. It was like every other boom town I'd seen. A mixture of mud, shacks, board-fronted stores, bars, room and houses, stables, horses, burrows, and men. Men everywhere. Milling and shoving along the plank walks and out into the street. Noisy, brawling, bearded, and tough. Rawhide flat. Half hour later, I rented a horse and rode up through the canyon north of town. Both banks of the creek were lined with miners busy with picks and shovels, pans and rockers. All of them breaking their backs. Sweating out their hearts for the same reason. Gold. About three miles up, I turned into the side canyon the man at the livery stable had told me about. And a few yards in, I found it blocked off by a six-foot rail fence. All right, mister. That's far enough. Yeah? Afraid I might jump that fence? Don't get smart. Just turn that horse around and head out the same way you came in. Why? I just got here. Is this the Boston pocket claim? That's right. You're as close to it right now as you're going to be. Go on, get me. Now, look, suppose you put that rifle away before it goes off and hurts somebody, huh? And go tell the owner his brother's here. But Mallory's got no brother. Now, get out. Mallory? Well, I heard it. Dave Storm is the owner of this claim. Storm? Are you Storm's brother? That's right. Is he around here? Get out of here, Storm. Put that horse and ride, do you hear me? He's the last one you're going to get. So start riding. All right, mister. I never argue with anybody who's packing a rifle, unless I've got one, too. And maybe the next time I will have. Come on, boy, get up! Yes? Oh, it's a storm. What are you doing here? How did you find my room? I asked one of the bartenders over at the Brass Nugget. Mind if I come in, Miss Blake? Of course I mind. Why, Bart, if Mr. Mallory found you here, he'd... He'd what? You only work for him. He doesn't own you, does he? That's no concern of yours. You're presuming a good deal simply because we rode in the same stagecoach. Now, get out. Uh, Miss Blake, I didn't come here with any presumption in mind. All I'm after is some information about my brother Dave. Where is he? I don't know anything about him. You brought his name up yourself during the trip this morning. I have nothing to say. Will you please leave? What's this about Bart Mallory owning Dave's Boston pocket claim? I know nothing about it. Dave's partner's called Dan Rivers. Do you know him? Get out. All right, Miss Blake. I'll find him. And it's nice to have seen you again. Look, if you want some good advice, leave town right now and don't ask any more questions. Why not? Never mind why not, Mr. Storm. Just get out of town fast. Thanks for the advice, Miss Blake. I'll decide whether it's good or not after I talk to my brother and his partner. Now, look, Dan, you're Dave's partner, so let's have it straight. 
Why does everybody shut up like a clam when I mention his name? What's this all about? Where's Dave, anyway? Jonathan, I... I wish somebody else had told you. Told me what? That David is dead. Dead? That's right, Jonathan. He was... He was... Go on, Dan. What happened? He was shot in the back. We found him lying in the street at the north edge of town. One morning a couple of weeks ago. I see. Who did it? You want the official story? Yeah, first. They say Dave dropped into the Brass Nugget Saloon late that night and sold the Boston pocket claim to Bart Mallory. Took $12,000 in gold certificates for it. And they say that's how come he was murdered and robbed after he left the Nugget. Has Mallory got a deed, a bill of sale? Yeah, he got one all right with Dave's name on it. How come Dave could sell the claim out from under you even if he wanted to? I thought the two of you were partners. We were, but we recorded the whole claim in Dave's name. And that way, only one of us had to make the trip to Sacramento. All right, all right. That's the official story. Let's have the other one. Dave wouldn't have sold out to Mallory for any amount of money. Mallory had been after him for weeks, but Dave and me both knew we had the best claim in Rawhide Flats. So? Some of his gunslingers bushwhacked Dave. Mallory turned up with his phony deed the next day. And everybody in town knows it, but nobody dares to say so. I suppose it's like every other boom camp. No law here yet, huh? Only what law a man can make for himself. In that case, I guess I better make a little. To fit this Bart Mallory. Uh, maybe you don't know exactly what you're tying into, son. Why, he's got half a dozen or more of the toughest boys in California on his payroll. We'll find out how tough they are. Don't count much on me. I, I'm an old man. All right, Dan. But they're not the best odds in the world. Can't be helped. You play with the cards you got. Dave used to tell me you were the coldest man he ever seen when it come to trouble. I think maybe he was right. Well, first thing I need is a gun. With odds the way they are, I guess I better have a six shooter. With you out of luck, Jonathan. I've heard of him, but you won't find one here in Rawhide. Oh, there's one here, all right. Well, I got it just today. Fellow named Mallory. Mallory? Now, now wait a minute. Now, look, Dan. Um... I taught a lot of my brother. And I don't like the way he was killed. I need that gun of Mallory's. I'm going to get it. And then I'm going to use it to get Mallory. That's the way it's going to be, Dan. You can count on it. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return you to the second act of Escape. But first, another Wednesday night, Star Night, coming up on CBS again tomorrow. The young fellow who made good on the Bing Crosby show last week will be back again for more songs and fun-making. The young fellow named Al Jolson, who Bing thinks is quite promising. Burns and Allen will be around again with more of their madcap humor, and Groucho Marx will be throwing the ad-libs fast and furiously on You Bet Your Life. And Dr. Christian, the only show in radio where the audience writes the scripts, will be announcing a great new prize contest. They're all heard on most of these same CBS stations. So tune in tomorrow night for Dr. Christian, Groucho Marx, Bing Crosby, and Burns and Allen. And now we return you to... Escape! I stepped inside the swinging doors of the Brass Nugget Saloon and looked things over. Finally, I had the bartender point out Mallory. He was sitting at a table in the back near the officers, playing poker with three other men. The two boys lounging against the wall behind him were obviously his bodyguards. I pushed my hat back on my head and walked toward the table. Well, there you are, boys. Four tens. I guess that ought to do it. Sorry to butt in, but, uh, is your name Barton Mallory? Yeah, that's right. Something I can do for you? My name is Storm. Jonathan Storm. This is the one I told you about, boss. You probably knew my brother. Oh, yes, David Storm. Sure, he used to come in here. So I heard. You got anything special in your mind? Yeah. Or... I need a gun. I understand you got a new six-shooter. I'm sorry, it's not for sale. I didn't say anything about buying it. 
I bet a thousand dollars against that gun on a cut for high card. What do you say? Sorry, Storm. The gun's out of it. Name something else. No, I want the gun. What's the matter, Mallory? The boys told me you'd bet on anything in the house if the odds were right. Yeah, that's right. I will. But the gun's a gift from a friend. Maybe you figure your luck's about to run out. Would that be it? All right, I'll take the bet. Benny, break out a new deck. Yeah. Well, there's the gun. Let's see a thousand. Sure. Mind if I shuffle? No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, maybe I should have warned you, Mallory. I got a feeling this is my lucky night. I'll take a chance it isn't. Mm. By the way, you wouldn't happen to have any idea who shot my brother in the back, would you, Mallory? No, I'm afraid not. The killer hasn't been identified yet. That's too bad. Maybe I'll have to identify him myself. You're cut, Mallory. All right. Ten of clubs, huh? Go ahead, Storm. Jack of diamonds. Thanks for the gun. Oh, it's already loaded, too. Well, I think I'll be... I've been looking all over the place, and I can't find... Oh, uh... Good evening, Miss Blake. How do you do, Mr. Storm? I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. No, no, no. I'm glad you came. Gives me an idea. Mallory... How'd you like another chance at my thousand dollars? What's the bet? High card again. Thousand dollars against a kiss from Miss Blake. What? Of course, maybe you don't have any say over it, huh? Wait a minute, the bet's on. You want to shuffle again? No, no, no. Go ahead, cut. Queen of Spades, you'll find that pretty hard to beat. Yeah, I guess you're right. Ace of Hearts does it, though. <laughs> my lucky night, Mallory. Well, Miss Blake, I guess you... Don't you dare. I'm afraid you don't have much choice about it, honey. I won this from your boss. You... You... (laughs) (laughs) It's too bad, Storm. Looks as if the lady doesn't like your brand. No, I guess not. I didn't expect her to be the one to have to tell me, though, Mallory. I kind of thought that you might resent that, might want to do something about it. Why? That's what she's here for. It's her job. She gets paid to take care of the customers. Why should I worry about a cheap little... Cop? Watch your talk! <laughs> Hold it, boys. You're covered. All right, Mallory. You better get up off the floor and call up those dogs of yours. If either one moves, I'll kill him. All right. All right, all right, boys. You can drop it. Storm. That was a pretty bad mistake you just made. I don't forget things. I think maybe this was your last lucky night. I'll make that a bet if you want. All right, boys, come on, let's go. Mallory and his gunman went into the office and didn't come back. Finally, after about an hour, I walked out of the brass nugget and bumped square into a middle-aged woman who'd been waiting for me just outside. She said Teresa wanted to see me right away in her room. that gun away, Mr. Storm. I'm here alone. This isn't a trap. And what is it? I want to know why you made that bet. I mean, about kissing me. Suppose we just say I wanted to. Let it go at that. You're afraid, aren't you? You're afraid not to be tough. Is that why you asked me to come here to tell me that? Well, don't you suppose a girl can, can have feeling less? But you can be sorry for things? Meet somebody, maybe. Go ahead, honey. You're doing fine. What do you mean? I mean I'm halfway ready to believe that. A little more of it, and I would believe it. And if I had any sense, I'd know better. I see. And that's the way you feel about it. It's a start, isn't it? This is the first time I have... Oh, it's easy. Try to find out. Get out. You don't understand anything. Go on. Get out. Get out. Get out. I'm telling you, son, it's the worst mistake you could have made. Knocking him down like you did last night, why, he won't think of nothing else. Not until he's killed you. 
People have tried that before, Dan. I'm still here. But you haven't got a chance. His gunner will be watching like hawks for the first second you're not covered. The whole town isn't on Mallory's payroll. I've got an idea. A lot of people around here might like to see him shown up. Provided somebody else called the play. Eh, maybe so, but still he's half a dozen of his gunslingers to deal with. I don't think so, Dan. If their boss is knocked over, they'll drift. I've seen hired guns before. Odds are against you, son. Well, I feel lucky. It's worth a chance to get Mallory. Not only for killing Dave, but because of what he's doing to Teresa Blake. Teresa Blake? Yeah, I kind of think she'd be a pretty decent kid. If it weren't for him. Yes, Johnson. That's what your brother Dave thought. What? He was crazy about her, too. Hung around the brass nugget every night. She kept leading him on. I guess that fitted in with Mallory's plan. Yeah. I guess it did. I guess it still does. What do you mean, son? Nothing, Dan, when you come right down to it. I guess when a... When a man turns soft, it always starts with his head. Uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan. I I didn't know you felt that way about it. Oh, it's all right. I'm glad you told me. Glad I found out in time. And now that I have, I think I can use Miss Blake. Why did you come here? What do you want? A short talk, honey. I don't want Mallory to see us. You've got to leave town. Leave now and don't come back, please. How much do you get for this, honey? I mean, talking me into leaving town and getting me out of Mallory's way. You fool. Oh, you fool. He doesn't mean a thing to me. It's you, don't you know that? I'll go with you if you'll only leave tonight. I'll go with you right now, please. No. I've gone too far now to turn back. I've got to finish it up. It's not too far yet, but it will be. Maybe you'll want to turn back then, only it'll be too late. A few hours from now, it'll all be done. And then maybe we can think about some other things. If you still want to. Want to? Of course I want to, Johnny. Johnny? Nobody's called me that for a long time. Terry, I want you to do something for me. Anything, Johnny, anything. Do you think you can get that deed to my brother's claim from Mallory's strong box and give it to me? I think so. Yes, of course I can. He trusts me enough. Yeah, how bet he does. How long will it take? Give me an hour. All right. Johnny, would... Would... Would you kiss me first? Sure, Terry. Oh, Johnny. That was better than the one I... I risked a thousand dollars for. Nobody could buy that for a thousand dollars. Nobody ever had. Come back into my room in an hour, Johnny. I'll have the deed. <laughs> I followed her into town, staying behind her in the darkness. And from the opposite side of the street, I watched her walk into the swinging doors of the brass nugget. Then I, I slipped into the shadows between two tar paper shacks and waited. It was a half hour before they came out of the saloon and headed down the street toward Teresa Blake's room and house. All six of Mallory's gunslingers. He wasn't taking any chances. Terry had double-crossed me after all. Just the same as she double-crossed my brother. And that was fine with me because I was ready for it. I walked into the brass nugget and down the hallway at the far end of the bar. I eased the six shooter into my hand and stopped in front of the door to Mallory's office. Come in. Evening, Mallory. Yep. I th- well, it's quite a surprise. Yeah, I imagine. Keep your hands on the desk. Well, sure, sure, store Mike. I don't have a gun anyway. Watch him, Johnny. He's lying. He carries one in his sleeve. You dirty little rat. Well, I didn't see you there in the corner, Miss Blake. Thought you might be down the street waiting to watch the fireworks. They made me tell, Johnny. One of the boys followed me and saw us together. When I came back here, they made me tell. They hit me, look. That must be real painful. Almost as bad as being shot in the back like Dave was. I didn't know what they were planning. I didn't know Bob was going to kill him. 
Charlie, I swear I... Drop it. Mallory, you've got a forged bill of sale there in your strong box. I want it. Sorry, Storm, you're out of luck. I won't open the box and you can't. What makes you figure you're in a position to argue about it? Why not? Because you've got a gun on me? You wouldn't shoot an unarmed man, Storm. What about that gun in your sleeve? I'm not drawing. I see. All right, Miss Blake, get out of here. Johnny, what, what are you... I said get out. And don't bother going after the boys. There won't be time. Johnny... Get out! Now, you won't draw, Mallory, huh? You're going to play it safe. Oh, it'd be crazy to do anything else. Maybe. The only way out of this room is through the door behind me. I noticed that kerosene lamp has a glass bowl on it. I ought to start a nice fire if I picked it up and smashed it against the wall. Storm! Storm, you fool! What about it, Mallory? My gun's in the holster. Want to stay there and burn or draw and try to get out? This place will go up like a tinderbox. Take your choice, Mallory. Draw or burn. Storm! Storm, you can't leave me in here like this. Draw or burn. All right, then, if you... Tough luck, Mallory. That's for Dave. And that's for me. All right, hold it a second, hold it. You better clear out of here fast. The place is on fire. And anybody that works for Bart Mallory is out of a job. He's dead. Are you all right? You're not hurt? No, I'm all right, Dan. Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, come on, son. Mallory's dead. I guess that takes care of it, Dan. Uh, Jonathan, you're the luckiest man alive. Yeah, sure. Somebody might go down to Jackson's rooming house. Tell those bushwhackers and Mallory's they can hit the trail north. The boss is dead. The boss is dead. It's ought to be far enough, Dan. Look. Look, the fire's breaking through to the roof. Won't be long now. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny, are you all right? Sure, I'm all right. What of it, Miss Blake? Thank heaven. Oh, Johnny, if anything had happened to you, I couldn't have gone on. Miss Blake, I... I've got something for you. It's a nugget. Some people might figure it's real gold. But actually, it's only brass. Hey, uh, pick it up. And then get going. What? What do you mean, Johnny? I mean you better catch up with the boys. They'll be heading north. But, but you said that we... Drop it. Oh, yes. Here's something else you can have, too. Your six shooter? No, no, no. It's yours. You bought and paid for it. It's got one shot left. Use it any way you want to. Only get out. Beat it. Johnny. You're wrong, you know. You're wrong about a lot of things. But what's the use? That's right. What's the use? Why, Johnny? Son, you hadn't ought to give her that pistol. That was your luck, you might call it. I think my luck's all run out, Dan. Yeah. Claim is all yours. I'm leaving in the morning, heading south. Why, son, there's, there's nothing south of here. Yeah. But it's the surest way I know to keep myself from heading north. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented The Pistol by Les Crutchfield. Featured in the cast were Gerald Moore as Jonathan Storm, Betty Lou Gerson as Terry Blake, Charlie McGraw as Bart Mallory, and Will Gear as Dan Rivers. Also heard was Eddie Marr. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week. You are in command of an English destroyer sailing to join the North Sea Patrol in October 1914. It is midnight, and from the enemy coast comes a desperate signal for help, which you would like to ignore, but from which there is no escape. Next week, we escape with Robert Buckner's exciting and unforgettable tale, The Man Who Won the War. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You 
are alone in Paris, unable to speak the language, unable to cope with a gigantic conspiracy which seeks to convince you that you are mad, and you know you are the victim of a plot from which there is no escape. <laughs> Escape, produced and today written by William N. Robeson and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Today we escape to Paris at the time of the Great Paris Exposition and one of the recurring legends of the 20th century in Alexander Wolcott's version of the story of the Vanishing Lady. Another cup of tea, Bruce. No, no, thank you, my dear. I'll just light up the pipe now and have a look at the evening standard. I'd like another, please, Mother. All right, Alice. Uh, uh, uh. Only one sugar, dear. We must watch our figures, you know. Oh, <laughs> what nonsense. A growing girl like Alice needs plenty of sugar. See, Mother, Daddy approves. Perhaps. But Mother is still boss. Yes, Mother. There's a dear. Mother. Yes, dear. I've been thinking... Yes, dear? I've been thinking about my grandparents. Oh. I know all about Daddy's parents. How Grandfather Stanley commanded a dreadnought at the Battle of Joplin. It was not a dreadnought, Alice. It was a heavy cruiser. Yes, heavy cruiser. <laughs> he got the V.C. And how Grandmother Stanley was a volunteer nurse at Western Arch when the Zeptons came over. And I know about your father, too, and how he died in India from his wounds and how gallant he was at the Khyber Pass. But, Mother... Yes, dear. You've never, never told me anything about Grandmother Winship. Haven't I? No, and I'd like to know something. Bruce. The child's 16. I think it's time she knew. But, Bruce... And you'd probably feel better to get it off your chest. What, Mother? What is it? Well, my dear, I've never talked about your grandmother because I've always half believed that someday, somehow... She'd come down our garden walk and... Oh, I know it sounds silly. And explain where she's been for the last 20 years. Why? What happened to her? I don't know, and I don't suppose I ever will. Cynthia, darling, if it's going to upset No, you... Bruce, you're quite right. It would be best to... get it off my chest, as you put it. As you know, Alice, I was born and brought up in India... And I was about your age when my father was killed in the Khyber campaign. Mother decided to leave India for good and return to her old home in Warwickshire. However, since it was necessary for her to go to Paris to attend to some details of my father's estate, she decided we should leave the P&O boat in Marseille and proceed by train. You may imagine the timidity with which we two unescorted ladies traveled across France without the slightest knowledge of the language. And without, indeed, assurance we could find a hotel room in Paris, though we had telegraphed for reservations for Marseille. You see, dear, the great Paris exposition had just opened and the city was jammed with visitors from all over the world. You may imagine our relief when we arrived at the Grand Hotel Universel and heard the clerk speak in quite ah, understandable that's English. Mademoiselle Winship, welcome, welcome. Uh, you will please to sign the register. Uh, you have our reservation. Oh, indeed, yes. Oh, most fortunate, madame, that you telegraphed. Uh, I reserve for you the last room in the house. Oh, I'm so relieved. Yes, Cynthia. You may as well learn now to sign a register, please, sir. Oh, yes, mama. Where do I write? There in that line. Oh, yes, I see. Voila. You are uh, fatigued from your journey, no? I shall have the boy show you to your rooms at once. Chasseur! Chasseur! Oui, monsieur. L'appartement 342 pour madame et mademoiselle Winship. Tout de suite. Um, bien, monsieur. Uh, this is your bagage, madame? Yes, these six. La voilà, le bagage. Cynthia. Il y a six pièces. Entendu. You, you best carry the little one with the medicine in it. Yes, maman. Le petit bon magasin. Thank you. I'll take that one. Uh, the little red one? Uh, très bien. Uh, this way, ladies. Keep your eye on that tortoise, Cynthia. I don't trust this Frenchman. Oh, Mama. I don't think he'll make off with our things. Oh, here's the lift. Troisième étage. Troisième. Oh, my 
do wish we could have gone straight on to Southampton. But you'd only have had to come back across the channel to see the solicitor, Mama. We really saved time this way. I suppose, I mean, I wish we hadn't come to Paris at all. Such a sinister place. Oh, Mama. Voilà, le troisième. This way, ladies, to the right. Attendez. C'est bien. 338, 343, 342. Oh, voilà. Entrez, ladies. Thank you. Oh, what a lovely big room. And look, Mama. French windows. Oh, and the park out there. And that square with the statue. Uh, the ladies did yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Merci. Oh, and the, thank you, those ladies. beautiful, beautiful bridges. Oh, Mama, it, it's like something out of a book. Yes, my dear. That's the trouble with Paris. So attractive. But underneath it's evil. Oh, and Mama, the furniture, the gilt clock. And this lovely marble top table. Oh, Mama, everything is so... So French. I'll be very glad to be on my way to where everything's English by this time tomorrow. Now, come away from that window and help me get into something comfortable. Yes, dear. Yes, Mama, of course. I don't know when I've been so tired. I, I just can't seem to catch my... Mama. <laughs> Mama, what's the matter? Mama. Mama, speak to me. Here, I'll get you up into bed. There. Now, let me loosen your closet. Here, Mama, here are the smelling salts. Breathe deeply, darling. Mama. The telephone. I've got to get a doctor. Uh, hello, operator. Will you please send a doctor up to room number... Uh, let me see. Number 342. Will you please send a doctor to room number 342? A, a doctor, a doctor, please. Oh. While I waited for the doctor, I did everything I could think of to bring my mother back to consciousness. I massaged her fingers and toes. I put wet cloths on her forehead. I waved the smelling salts under her nose. But she lay silent and white and unmoving, like one dead. Only the quick, shallow movement of her breast assured me she was not. And all the time, another anxiety possessed me. What if this doctor could not speak English? How should I tell him the circumstances of Mother's unexpected fainting? How should I understand his instructions for treatment? I'm sure it was not long, although it seemed like an eternity before he arrived, accompanied by the manager of the hotel. And to my great relief, they both spoke English. The doctor felt Mother's pulse, took her temperature, and did the usual things that doctors do. And then he turned to the tail-coated hotel manager. La jeune femme parle de français. Pas un mot. Vous en êtes sûr Tout à fait. Alors, je peux parler à mon aise. Monsieur, ceci, c'est une affaire très sérieuse. N'ayez pas l'air alarmé lorsque je vous mets au courant. Cette femme est atteinte de la peste. La peste Elle n'a qu'une heure à vivre. Je n'ai pas besoin de vous dire que si ceci se connaît, votre hôtel perdra tous ses clients. Ils m'ont tué par ce monde. While they talked in this language, I couldn't understand. I looked from one face to the other, trying to read from their expressions how serious my mother's illness was. But they were as casual as though they were ordering dinner. And finally, I could stand it no longer. Oh, you must tell me. What is the matter with her? Mademoiselle, your mother is ill, yes. Seriously ill. It is a collapse due, perhaps, to the strain of traveling. However, a week or two of absolute rest will work wonders. A week or two? Well, we'd, we were to go on to England tomorrow. Uh, that would be out of the question, mademoiselle. She cannot be moved for at least several days. Uh, right now, she must have complete rest. The next 24 hours will be critical. Oh, Mama. Poor Mama. No, 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 Mademoiselle, you must not break down, too. Uh, I need your help. Yes, Doctor. Immediately, I need some medicine. Will you fetch it for me? Why? I must not yes. leave your mother for a moment during these critical hours. Here, I will write down this address and a little message to my wife. Your wife? Yes, yes. I have the medicine already prepared at home. It would be faster to go there for it than to a pharmacy. There are very few chemists who have the ingredient. But couldn't you telephone? Alas, I have no telephone. A, a messenger, perhaps. <laughs> Mademoiselle does not know Paris en fait. Uh, with the exposition opening, nowhere can you find a reliable messenger. They are all selling uh, souvenirs. But, uh, oh, no, Mademoiselle. You will accomplish here and more rapidly yourself. Uh, here is the address. 24 bis, Rue Val-de-Grâce. 
And here is the message to give to my wife. But I don't know Paris at all. I'm a total stranger here. I am sure the manager here will give the uh, necessary instructions to the cabbie. Indeed, I will. Now, if mademoiselle is ready... Before I quite knew what was happening, I was seated in a rickety taxi cab outside the hotel with the doctor's message clutched in my hand. While the hotel manager gave Maintenant, valuable directions to the cabby. En plus, vous toucherez un pourboire assez grand pour remplacer cette vieille bagnole avec une belle voiture. Allez au petit pas. Prenez la, la, la piste la plus circuiteuse. Et surtout, ne soyez pas de retour en moins de deux heures. Entendu Entendu. Bon. It is arranged, mademoiselle. Jacques is one of our most trusted cabbies. He will get you to the doctor's house and back in safety. Oh, thank you so much, sir. And you will look after mother, won't you? Indeed, I will. Of that, you may be sure. When we left the hotel, we crossed a huge square with statues around it and turned into a wide avenue which led up a gentle incline at the top of which was a huge arch. But before long, we turned off to the right into narrower streets. It must have been 20 minutes later when we turned into another wide boulevard and I saw another huge arch up ahead. Or was it the same arch? Driver! Mademoiselle! Haven't we passed that arch before? Regardez, mademoiselle. Voici l'arc de triomphe. Driver, I don't want a sightseeing tour. I want to go to this address directly. Don't you understand? Now, please, take me there at once. Eh ben, on fait son mieux. De la patience, mademoiselle. Paris, c'est une grande ville, voyons. At last, we turned into a narrow street and pulled up before a grim grey house. The blue enamel sign on the wall read number 24 bis. I jumped out of the cab almost before it stopped, rushed up the three stone steps and pulled at the brass bell knob. Oh, hurry. Hurry, hurry, please. We? Oh, oh the, the doctor sent me for some medicine. Here, read this, please. Retenez cette jeune femme aussi longtemps possible. C'est de la plus grande importance pour l'avenir de Paris et même de la France. Oh! Entrez, mademoiselle. Thank you. Quand vous ne pouvez plus la faire attendre, donnez-lui une bouteille de pastilles. The doctor's wife stood there reading and rereading the note as though she didn't understand it. And until I thought I would scream. Please, please hurry. Get me the medicine. It's my mother. She may be dying. I must get back to her. Please hurry. Asseyez-vous. She pointed to a chair. Attendez. She slowly walked down the hall and closed the door behind her. I waited and waited. And I wondered... I wondered about the time the taxi had taken to get here. About that arch that looked so familiar. And I was torn by the hundred nameless anxieties that torture you when you're nearest and dearest is ill. And then I heard something that froze my blood. A telephone. A telephone clearly ringing somewhere in the house. But the doctor had said he had no telephone. That was the reason I must come all this way for the medicine. Oh, no, it couldn't be in this house. It must be next door or across the street. Of course, that's where the sound was coming from. Hello? But no. It was the voice of the doctor's wife answering the phone. Oh, no. No, what monstrous plot was this? I felt my scalp crawl with terror. My brain pounded and my head felt as though it would burst. I wanted to scream, to run out of this awful house, to run all the way across Paris to the bedside of my mother. Madame, well, mademoiselle. <gasps> oh, thank you. Thank you. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Now, driver, please... Please, in the name of your own mother, hurry back to the hotel as fast as possible, please. Ah, oui. On fait son mieux, mademoiselle. Roulons. But my pleading was of no use. Either it was misunderstood or ignored. We crawled across Paris, just as slowly as we had come. And I was certain I saw that same white arch three times. But at last we crossed the great square with the statues. And I knew we were close to the hotel. Oh, please, please hurry. Just beyond the great square, we turned up a narrow street which shortly entered a wide circle, in the middle of which was a tall, slender monument. The driver swung around the monument and pulled up before the entrance of the hotel, reached back and opened the door. I jumped out of the cab. And then I saw the sign over the entrance. It said... Hotel Ritz. Driver? 
Strava, you've taken me to the wrong hotel. I'm staying at the Grand Hotel Universal. Mais non, mademoiselle. Je vous ai pris au rich. Et je vous dépose au rich. No, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Mais... Will you please take me to the Grand Hotel Universal? C'est ici que je vous ai pris en charge et c'est ici que je vous le pose. Oh, you stupid, stupid man, can't you understand? My mother is sick. You've taken more than two hours to get me to the doctor's house and back. Can't you understand? My mother is sick, perhaps dying. Les affaires de mademoiselle ne me regardent pas. I looked around me. A small group of persons by stopped and were listening curiously to the argument. And then they joined in, t- taking sides. Everywhere I looked were foreign faces. Strangers, enemies. And then, shouldering through the crowd, I saw a bareheaded young man in trees, with a pipe clamped in his teeth. And before he had a chance to speak, I knew help had come. I say, having some trouble. Oh, thank heavens, you're English. Right, you are. Now, what seems to be the matter? I told him as rapidly as I could. And he paid the mulish cabby. He popped me into another cab. Five minutes later, we walked up into the lobby of the Grand Hotel Universal. The manager was behind the desk. My mother, is she all right? I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. My mother, Mrs. Winship in 342, is she all right? <laughs> there is no uh, Madame Winship in 342. What? 342 is occupied by Monsieur Auguste Noailles, a permanent guest. Don't you remember me? I'm Cynthia Winship. Two hours ago, you put me into a taxi to go to the doctor's house for some medicine for my mother. I am afraid that Mademoiselle is mistaken. I have never seen her before in my life. Well, look here, what is this? Well, listen, I swear to you. It's just as I say. We signed the register less than three hours ago. We got in on the train from Marseille. Well, let's have a look at the register. Yes. I'll show you I'm in 342. Where is the register? It is there, Mademoiselle. You may see it for yourself. See, today's date. Fourteen guests registered, but I do not see any Mademoiselle or Madame Winship. Do you? No. What have you done with my mother? Please, what have you done with my mother? I demand you answer me this minute. Mademoiselle, what I, have you done with with I should not like to have to ask you to leave. Mr. Richard, please. We we'll get to the bottom of this. Perhaps Mademoiselle is mistaken. Perhaps she is registered at some other hotel. No. This is the hotel. The Grand Universal. You... You were standing there when we arrived. You handed my mother the pen with which she registered. You came to the door with a doctor. You put me in a taxi. But I assure you, mademoiselle, these are fantastic. Wait a minute, that is that is all. there. He carried our baggage. He'll remember. Uh, Garçon. Uh, oui, monsieur. Vous vous souvenez d'avoir porté le bagage de madame en numéro 3, 4, 2, cet après-midi. No, monsieur. Uh, there were six pieces, don't you remember? You wanted to take them all, and I insisted on carrying the little jewel case. It was a little red one. Oh, no, mademoiselle... C'est la première fois de ma vie que je vois mademoiselle. He says he never saw you in his life before. But this is monstrous. It's, it's impossible. My mother is somewhere in this hotel. What have you done with her? What have you done with her? Feeling better now, Miss Winship? A little, thank you. Care for something else? No, thank you. Uh, another cup of tea, perhaps? Certainly. Hey, Garçon? Monsieur? Uh, un tasse de thé pour mademoiselle. Tout de suite, monsieur. I... I don't know how to thank you, mister. You realize I, I don't even know your name? Oh. It's Bruce. Bruce Stanley. I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Stanley. It's a pleasure, Miss Winship. Mr. Stanley, you believe me, well, don't you? Of course I do, Miss We did Winship. register at that hotel. We were in room 342. Well, I can even describe the furnishings. There was a big window that went from the ceiling to the floor. Well, every hotel room in Paris has windows like that, Miss Winship. Oh, they do? Yes. Well, in this room, the draperies were plum-colored, and there was a marble-top table, black marble it was, and a gilt clock that had run down. The hands had stopped, I remember, at 20 minutes past three. The walls were covered in rose brocade, and the bedspread was a washed-out yellow. Oh, if I could only get into that room, you'd see that I'm not making this up. I'm well, I, not... I'm sure you aren't. Perhaps I can find a way to make them let you in the room. Can you? Yes. Uh, I'm with the embassy, you know, undersecretary sort of thing. I believe the British Empire has enough influence to change the mind of an obstinate Paris innkeeper. Well, then let's do it. Right away. Well, I'm afraid the might of Britain can't move that fast. It's past dinner time. But but tomorrow we shall see. Tomorrow? But I must get into that room tonight. I... I have no money. No way to sleep. Well, we can do nothing with the people at the hotel. You saw that. We'll just have to be patient until tomorrow... I'm sure I can find a room for you tonight in a pension near the embassy. You're so very kind. 
How can I ever thank you, Mr. Stanley? Well, you, you might begin by calling me Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Cynthia. Oh. What oh, is I just thought of something. The doctor. The doctor? Yes, the one the hotel manager brought in to look after Mother. I still have his address somewhere here in my purse. Yes, here it is. Now, we must go there immediately. He can tell us about Mother. Well, let me see. 24 B's Rue Val de Gras. Well, that's not far. Just off Boulevard Raspail, near the Luxembourg. Well, how long would it take to get there by taxi? Oh, about ten minutes. But it... It took over an hour this afternoon. <laughs> Well, here we are. Yes, this is the place. Attendez, mon vieux. The house is dark. Well, it's quite late. Well, I don't care. We've got to find out tonight. Where is he? There, at the upstairs window. Uh, Monsieur le docteur, cette mademoiselle Winship. Elle veut vous questionner à propos de sa mère. Winship, je ne connais pas mademoiselle Winship. He says he doesn't know you. But he must. He must. It... Doctor, don't you remember this afternoon? You sent me here to your house for medicine for my mother. Je ne comprends pas l'anglais. He says he doesn't understand English. Oh, the liar. The dreadful liar. He does. He speaks perfect English. Et vous, jeune homme, je vous conseille de ne pas déranger le repos des gens comme il faut et de vous en aller avant que je n'appelle la police. Ah, I'm sorry, Cynthia. Oh, Bruce. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? If it hadn't been for Bruce, I'm certain I should have gone out of my mind. He found a room for me at a pension near the embassy, where I spent a sleepless night of anxiety, almost beyond endurance. Bruce called for me at half past ten the next morning and took me back to the hotel. To my surprise... The attitude of the manager had changed completely. But of course, Mademoiselle may inspect room 342. We are only too glad to convince Mademoiselle that her mother is not and never was in the Grand Hotel Universel. Why, I... I, I personally will escort you to the room. This way, please, to the ascenseur. Oh, Bruce, that terrible man. That horrible, Cynthia, horrible... Cynthia, don't let him upset you. Monsieur, troisième. Troisième, monsieur. Now, remember what I told you last night, Bruce. You'll see. Plum-colored draperies, black marble top table, rose walls, and a gilt clock with hands stopped at 20 minutes past three. You'll see. Yes, sir. Voila. Look for him. This way, please. It was room 342 that you wished to see, mademoiselle? Yes, that's right. Third door to the right. Parfait. You see, Bruce? I know where it is. Yes, my dear. There we are. Voila. Enter, please. Now, Bruce, you'll see. The yellow bedspread... Oh. Not quite the room you just described in the elevator, mademoiselle. The drapes are royal blue. Oh. A little dusty, I fear. Uh, I must have this room renovated. You see, there is no marble top table. No. The clock, as you notice, is running. And right on time, it seems. And the walls are not rose brocade, but yellow flowered no. wallpaper. Now, my dear mademoiselle, you see how thoroughly mistaken you are. No, no, no! They have tried to make me think I was mad. They succeeded. I remembered nothing until I awoke in my aunt's house in England two weeks later. Thanks to Bruce, who never left my side during those terrible days when my sanity hung in the balance. Well, that's the story, Alice. And that's why I've never been able to talk about your grandmother, Winship. Oh, Mother, how horrible. Because all these years I've clung to the foolish hope that somehow she'd come back and tell us herself what happened. You poor dear. You may as well dispel that hope forever, Cynthia. What? Since you've at last brought yourself to discuss your mother's disappearance, I think it's time you knew the true fact. Bruce. Your mother died 20 minutes after you left the hotel on that fool's errand for the doctor. Oh, no. She died of the bubonic plague. 
She had caught it in India before she sailed. The doctor recognized the symptoms the moment he examined her. He told the hotel manager in French in your presence. They agreed that the matter must be kept completely secret. If the news leaked out that there was a case of plague in Paris, the city would have been empty to visitors. The exposition would have been a failure. Oh, Bruce. The conspiracy of silence began in the hotel. The bellboy was paid to claim he never saw you. The taxi driver was paid well to take you to the doctor's house by the most roundabout route. The note to the doctor's wife advised her to detain you as long as she could. The taxi driver added his own imaginative touch by returning you to the Ritz instead of the Universal. I shudder to think what might have happened if I hadn't come through the Place Vendôme just then. But you didn't know? Not then. When did you find out? Next morning. By then, the conspiracy had grown to international proportions. The embassy had been advised. If the exposition was a failure, the franc would fall, and the pound sterling would be affected, that sort of thing. I knew when we went back to the hotel, you would not find your plum drapes and rose-colored walls and black marble-top table. And you let me go through with it. What could I do? I was acting under orders. I knew that the hotel had completely fumigated and redecorated the room overnight, and everything was in readiness to repudiate your story. I had to let the last act of that dreadful farce play to its dreadful end. What did they do with my mother? Her body was removed from the room less than 30 minutes after you left it. It immediately burned. Why? Why didn't you tell me all this years ago? Why did you let me go on all this time? This, this is the first time you've ever mentioned your mother since then, my dear. Alice? Yes, Mother? There's a new issue of the Tatler in the library. Wouldn't you like to look at it? Mother, I want... Now, dear, there's a good girl. I want to have a talk with your father. Escape. Produced by William N. Robeson and directed by Norman MacDonald, has brought you The Vanishing Lady by Alexander Wolcott, freely adapted for radio by Mr. Robeson. The part of Cynthia was played by Joan Banks. Bruce was played by High Aberback. The hotel manager and driver by Ramsey Hill. Musical score was conceived by Cy Feuer with Eddie Dunstetter at the console. Next week... You are deathly afraid of snakes. And between you and a fortune... Between you and escape, you're on the white jaws of a deadly cotton mouth. Next week, we escape with Irvin S. Cobb's famous story, Snake Doctor. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, we, when we again offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to a lonely schooner sailing through the hot Caribbean night, carrying a fortune and the heedless passions of reckless men as John and Gwen Bagney tell it in their exciting tale, The Sure Thing. Before we hear tonight's story, a brief message from the Ford Dealers of America. Over 140,000 delighted motorists are already driving the new 50 Ford. Here is what Mrs. William M. Kirby of Kansas City, Missouri, who breeds the rare Sealingham and Dandy Denmark Terrier, says about her new Ford. I think my new Ford station wagon is just wonderful. It has such style and beauty. I use it to transport my Terriers, and they love it. 
And, of course, it doubles as a passenger car as well. It's so comfortable and easy to handle. I've had station wagons before, but this one is the strongest, safest, and best I've ever had. Yes, we Ford dealers are swamped with comments like that. But don't take anyone's word for this new 50 Ford. Prove it for yourself. Look up your nearest Ford dealer in the classified phone directory. Perhaps you know him personally. He'll arrange a test drive in the 50 Ford. Test drive it for comfort, for power, for safety, for the quietness which is its mark of quality. Test drive it for the new Ford feel which stamps the 50 Ford as the one fine car in the low price field. Before you buy any car at any price, test drive the 50 Ford at your Ford dealers tomorrow. And now we invite you to Escape. This way, senor. Thank you. If you would please wait in here in the president's office. Fine. You understand, senor, I have not the authority to handle the matter myself. Yes, of course, I understand. You see, a bank draft of two million dollars, it is a matter of such importance. Uh, senor Jose Perez, the president of the bank, he is the only one. That's perfectly all right. I'll wait for senor Perez. Uh, gracias, senor, gracias. Wait. Yes, I could wait. I'd come this far, I could afford a few more minutes. It was hard to believe. Just a short while ago, I'd been ship doctor on the S.S. Martina, the gilded ferry boat of the Caribbean. And now, now I sat back in a comfortable chair and went over the whole thing again in my mind, just the way it happened, from the beginning. We had just cleared the Straits of Yucatan on our way to Havana when the 23-word message came that started the whole thing. That's uh, the same thing, Doc. SOS latitude 23 north, longitude 85 west, accident case on board schooner Siddham, en route Havana. Urgently need doctor. Can you board us? That all? No answer as to the type of injury? No, I don't get it, Doc. He's standing just off the starboard, and they still keep sending the same message. Life boat's ready, Doctor. Coming. Got all your gear? All well, set. Let's go. As we pulled away from our ship, I could just barely make out the schooner, feeling for a wandering current in the growing dust. She was a 42-footer, and from her high bow, she sloped away neatly in a sweeping sheer line to a trim square stern. The city. The name seemed to fit her. Aloof and aristocratic. As we pulled alongside, a huge, swarthy fellow helped me aboard. Watch your step. Uh, easy. There you are. Yeah, thanks. Now, where's the patient? He's below. What'd you bring the stretcher for? Who are you? I'm the owner, Felix O'Rouge. You can't take him off this boat. He's too weak. I'll decide that. Come on, Olsen. Come in, Doc. We went below, and in the forward stateroom, I found my patient, an old man. And with him, a girl. Oh, Doctor, thank heaven you're here. He had an accident. He's terribly got ill. I've been so mm, worried. Bad shock. Pulse pretty slow. You're not going to take him away, are you? No way. No, 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 Ken. Easy now. Have you enough oil board to reach a van if the wind doesn't hold? Yes, I think so. Okay. Olsen. Yeah, Doc? You go on back. Mm. This man is in no condition to be moved. What about you? I'll meet the ship in Havana. We ought to be there in some time tomorrow. Yeah, but the skipper... I'll take the responsibility. Okay, you're the doctor. All right, let's have a look here. Oh. Easy now. <laughs> no, 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 don't <laughs> try to talk. <laughs> How long has he been this way? Two days. Two days? Doctor, the wound, I'm afraid that... Yes, it's badly infected. Who did the surgery on him? Surgery? Who probed for the bullet? Bullet? There was no bullet. He was injured splicing a back stay with a marlin spike. He was what? You see, he was carrying the marlin spike in his hand when Felix had to come about. It threw him off balance and he fell. I've dug out too many bullets not to recognize the kind of mess they make. It was a marlin spike. Yes? Well, you can yell marlin spike all the way to Havana, but it isn't going to change my report. Report? No. No bullet. Marlin spike. Marlin. Lie back. No. This won't hurt. But... Uh, Just a hypodermic. No, 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 dope. I don't want to... But I've got to probe. You can't take it if you're conscious. No anesthetic. 
Only brandy. Doctor, give him the anesthetic. Oh, no. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Stephanie? You're out of your mind. Joseph, I just want to save you the pain and the doctor. Get him the brandy. But, doctor... It's his body. If that's what he wants, that's the way you'll have to have it. Now get the brandy. Oh, thank you. And, doctor... Yes? Send Stephanie away. Don't want her around me. She went away, but she didn't like it. And I got to work. For the next couple of hours, I was pretty busy. It was well after 10 o'clock when I felt it was safe to leave the old man and go up on deck to catch a smoke. Halfway up the companionway, I ran into Felix on his way down. Well, Doc, how's the old boy? Is he going to kick off? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I think he's going to be all right. You think? What do you know? I'm only a doctor. I've done everything I can for him. Hey, wait a minute. Where are you going? I want to see him. i got to talk to him. I wouldn't advise him. But since when are you giving the orders around here? Since I came aboard. I don't want him disturbed. He needs to rest. Oh? You got any objections if I get myself a cup of coffee? No. So long as you stay away from my patient. Oh. oh, I didn't hear you come up. You handle the wheel like an old salt. Oh, I don't know much about it. I just do what Felix tells me. How's Joseph? You've been down there such a long time, I thought that maybe... That he died? That's a horrible thing to say. Of course not. Who is Joseph? Your husband? No, I'm his secretary. Oh. Then this is a business trip. In a way. Doctor, what are you getting at? Did you shoot him? Why would I shoot him and then call for a doctor out here in the middle of the ocean? I don't know. And after tomorrow, I won't care. You realize, of course, that my report to the authorities in Havana will be according to my own findings. I suppose so. I don't imagine that there's any way of changing your mind. Is there, Doctor? This is a beautiful schooner. Belong to your boss? Yes. I wonder... Do you mind if I take the wheel for a while? It's been a long time. Oh, you know how to sail? Yeah. Used to, back in Maine. All right. Go ahead. Oh... Feels good. <laughs> she sure handles like a dream. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. What's wrong, Doctor? Look at that binnacle. We're not headed for Havana. We're headed in the opposite direction. <laughs> the Sydney was racing along with sails full, but she wasn't sailing Jewish to Havana. The compass said she was sailing southwest, away from Havana as fast as wind and sail could take her. I laid her on the starboard tack and started to bring her about. The sails bellied out, catching the wind as it shifted across the bow. And then, as they started to fill away, the mainest boom swung over. Just as I ducked to avoid it, I shot my hand. I put up my hand to steady myself against the main boom and there in the wood. Right where my head would have been if I hadn't ducked was the bullet. Across the deck, still away from the light, the companionway, stood Felix, polishing his gun with a handkerchief. You shouldn't pack, Doctor, when a man's cleaning his gun. Cleaning your gun in the dark in the middle of the night? Yeah, I suppose it is dangerous. I see you don't like our course. I was under the impression this craft was bound for Havana. That's right, Doc, we are. Then why are we sailing southwest? Southwest? Well, that's a woman for you. You can't trust them behind the wheel of a car, and they know better behind the wheel of a boat. Oh, no, Felix, you don't blame me for that. I don't know a thing about it, course. I did what you told me. Now, why didn't you do it right? If I'm so incompetent, maybe you'd better handle it yourself. Maybe I will. I didn't know what that game was. The lie, Marlin spite, nocturnal gun cleaning, change of course. But one thing was certain. I intended to get to Havana if it was the last thing I ever did. And to make sure it wasn't the last thing, this was one night I wouldn't sleep. I went down to the old man's stateroom where I left my bag to get some benzodrine. While I was there, I checked on him. He was sleeping quietly. He wouldn't need me. I opened the bag, took the tablets, and suddenly my hand stopped in midair. My hypodermic needle, loaded with the anesthetic that Joseph had refused, was gone. In just a moment, we will return to escape. But first... A message from the Ford dealers of America. 
Already, more than 140,000 new owners know that the 1950 Ford is something really special. We Ford dealers know it. We want you to know it, too. That's why we invite you to test the 50 Ford yourself. From the moment you get behind the wheel, you'll see and feel quality. A finger's touch brings the great new V8 engine quietly to life, no matter how cold the weather. Before you've driven a block, you'll experience the joy of that flashing V8 acceleration and power. You'll know the quietness of quality in the motor and the sound-conditioned body. Your first touch of the brakes, the largest in the low-price field, brings a new feeling of safety and security. And try the worst roads you know. See how the midship ride gives you the comfort and roadability of America's most expensive cars. Any Ford dealer will be delighted to arrange a test drive. If you don't know him personally, he's listed in the classified phone book. Call him tomorrow. Before you buy any car at any price, Test drive the 50 Ford. It will open your eyes. And now we return you to the second act of... Escape. Can't you sleep? Are you still worried about the course? See, we're sailing due east. Very commendable. Mind if I take the wheel a while? No, I don't mind at all. Keep a due east, Doc. I want to get to Havana. I watched his truculent board back as he moved across the deck and disappeared below. The moon was as bright as day and as reassuring. And then the sail swung out, covering it, throwing the deck into blackness. That's why I didn't realize at first anyone was approaching until I saw the glow of the cigarette. I tensed myself. My hand clutched at something in the cockpit. It was a wrench. The cigarette moved closer. I waited. The sail bellowed back. And I saw her full in the moonlight. I have to talk to you. Go ahead. Talk. I'm afraid I haven't been very honest with you. I'm afraid you haven't. I lied to you and I realize now how foolish it was. But... Doctor, I'm afraid of Felix. Are you trying to tell me it was Felix who shot the old man? Yes, and he made me lie about it. Uh, like you lied about the cause. You'll never get to Havana. He's letting you think that you're going there now, but... He'll figure out something. I'm sure he will. If that target practice a few moments ago was any sample. Oh, he wasn't trying to kill you. Felix wouldn't kill you now, not as long as Joseph needs you. I, I mean... The... Well, you're not making sense again. Felix wants me to keep Joseph alive, and, and yet Felix shot Joseph. It, it was just a fit of anger, an argument. Felix has a terrible temper. Why, he'd be a fool to kill Joseph. Well, what makes Joseph so valuable? Well... I suppose I should tell you all of it. <laughs> it might be a good idea. I told you the truth about one thing, at least. I am his secretary. Only his name isn't just Joseph. It's Joseph Ingram. Ingram? No wonder his face was familiar. He's the big aviation tycoon. Uh, uh, but Ingram was killed two weeks ago. I read it about it in the papers. A transcontinental airliner crashed into a mountain. That's the luck of Joseph Ingram. We were on our way to Washington. He'd been subpoenaed to have his war contract investigated. He was guilty of sin, and the public was really worked up about it. He was a singe to be indicted. And his wife, who'd put up with his selfishness and greed through 20 years of marriage, couldn't take it anymore and left him. But, but... We had got off the plane at Albuquerque to answer a wire from his attorney. But the radio and newspapers obituaried him to death. I know. That's how things happen for him. Apparently, there, there was just no record of us leaving the plane, and they only found half of the survivors. Some of those they couldn't identify. Go on. Well, when Joseph realized that he was officially dead, he saw the way out. He'd been looking desperately for a chance to disappear, and now he had it. He phoned Felix in Florida to have the sitting ready, and... We took a train down and boarded her there. Mm, I see. So but... why do you think I'm on this boat? Do you think I wanted to come? Do you think I wanted to leave my whole life behind? I was forced to come. I was the only one who knew that Joseph was still alive. And now you know. What about Felix? Felix is Joseph's handyman, so to speak. And Joseph owns Felix, body and soul. Just like he owns everyone who works for him. And you? I saw a chance to go further with Joseph than with any other man. Mm. Then maybe the needle isn't meant for Joseph. Needle? 
What needle? A hypodermic needle loaded with anesthetic. It's missing from my bag. And it looks now like it's meant for you. Oh, no. Oh, no, he can't. He wouldn't... I'm afraid we'll have to be more realistic. We? If you'll forgive the pun. I'm afraid we're both in the same boat. There was desperation in her face. I felt sorry for her. She was in this mess up to her neck and she was afraid. And yet it was good having her beside me there in the cockpit. It was pleasant to be with her. Just the two of them. The moon and the sea. Well, anyway, the hypodermic needle was the farthest thing from my mind when I took her in my arms. And then it happened. I felt the sting of it pierce my flesh. Oh, the needle, you... What are you talking about? The needle, you stuck me with it. Needle? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. It was just my brooch. It's, it's always coming up. Brooch? Oh, <laughs> Oh, I, I thought that oh, was silly. Here. Fasten it for me, will you please? Yes. Yes, of course. Why, you're shaking. It's that missing hypodermic. It has me rattled. I've got to get it back. You'll get it back. Yes, but when? How? Right now, Doctor. Like this. <laughs> She used the needle deftly, in one motion plunged at my arm, and tried to struggle to my feet. Her face was mocking me. I grabbed for her, but the drug was warm and deadening. And after a blood moment, I was gone. What? I could hear them from a long way off. I came to you slowly, then I lay there listening. I only did what you told me. You're the one who bundled it. It's a good thing I they were both standing over me, working on me, doing everything they could to bring me through. a lot of trouble to use that needle. Now you've spoiled everything. Why did you have to rush the... You want to know what our money is, don't you? Well, you haven't found out, and now maybe you won't. If you'd only let Joseph alone, but no, no, you couldn't wait. As soon as the doctor was unconscious, he had to work him over. If Joseph dies now, we'll never find out where he hid it. It's on his boat. I know that. Oh, and you I know. didn't hurt him. I just pushed him around. Oh, over. that stupid temper of yours. That awful impatience. You'd think you could have waited for two million dollars. Two million dollars. Now it began to make some sense. Now everything made sense. As long as Joseph needed a doctor and wouldn't tell where the money was, we both lived. But if I couldn't keep him alive... Get on your feet. Doc! Come on, Doc. I'm on your feet. Feel it, easy. Fitz, what are you getting so touchy? Come on! All right, all right. I'm on my feet. Welcome back, Doc. Now, get below. The old man needs He's had a relapse. Stephanie, take the wheel. I said get below, Doc. I'm not in the mood to take orders. Maybe this will put you in the mood. He creased my chin with a short jab. My knees buckled. I swung at him and missed I saw another one coming. This time I ducked and connected with a roundhouse on the side of his head that sent him wheeling along the white narrow deck. I started after him. Just as the boat came about violently, heeling over with a lee rail under, I wildly grabbed the guy line just in time to see the sea crawl backwards into the sea. I whirled around. The girl had done it, spinning the wheel like crazy. I dashed back to the cockpit, tried to grab it away from her. She flopped me like a tiger, but I finally pushed her off right at the boat and brought her about. But Felix was nowhere in sight. We tacked around, searching for him, but it was useless. It was an accident. He's gone. You've killed him. You, you ought to be glad he's gone. Why? Well, it was either you or him. Uh, your concern touches me. Besides, we don't need him, don't you see? You know how to handle a boat and you're a doctor. You can keep Joseph alive and until we make him talk. And when we find out where his money is, we can get rid of him. And, and sail away into the sunset, That's huh? right. Just you and me. Yeah. No, thanks. I'll play the original handout in Havana. I don't think so, Doctor. I'm setting the course now. And if you're interested, I'm a much better shot than Felix. I won't hit the boom. The gun glittered in the moonlight, and she was smiling at me. And then I wasn't looking at her, but beyond her. First, I wasn't sure. I just sensed the movement, and then I saw him. 
Joseph Ingram, barefooted and in pajamas, pulling himself painfully up the companionway, forcing his body to make the effort. Joseph! You wanted too much, Stephanie. My money and Felix is you. Felix is gone. He had an accident. Uh, like mine, I suppose. If only you hadn't been so greedy. If only you'd waited, you'd have gotten your share. Joseph, you're sick. You're... You were such a little fool, Stephanie. In the heel of my shoe, in my cabin, is a draft on the National Bank of Venezuela for two million dollars. Payable to Barra. So that's where it is. Thank you, Joseph. That's very generous of you. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't been watching. A bullet in the stomach, yet he kept coming at him, lumbering barefooted across the deck like a wounded bear in blue silk pajamas. So easy. She backed away from him, emptying her gun into him, but he kept coming. Not so easy. No, Joseph. She was at the edge of the deck as he collapsed against her, his heavy arms and a death grip around her like a cartwheel. They swung together over the side into the inky blackness of the sea. Two million dollars in the heel of a shoe. <laughs> it was in the heel of the shoe, all right. I went below and found it. Just a piece of paper that three people had died over. Two million dollars. Certified backwards and forwards. Payable to bear. In just a few hours, it would be daylight. I could be in Havana by noon. Back to the Martina. Back to the dispensary. Back to the endless round of seasick pills, hangover remedies, and <laughs> when I'm lucky, maybe a sprained ankle. Or Venezuela. The choice was simple. There was no risk at all. It was a cinch. It was a sure thing. It was payable to bear. Good afternoon, senor. Sorry I have kept you waiting. Uh, you presented this bank to for payment, senor? Yes. Are uh, you, senor Perez? Uh, that is right. I am president of the bank. Uh, this draft, it is quite a large sum. There's nothing wrong with the draft, is there? Oh, no, senor. It is in order. Uh, good. And you wish us to transfer this money to your bank in the United States? Uh, no. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I wish to open an account here. Oh, but certainly. Gomez. You will make the arrangement for the senor. Uh, si, senor Paris, at once. And now, uh, uh, there is a lady, a country woman of yours, waiting to see you. Uh, uh, please to step this way, senor. To see me, but who? Oh. Oh, Joseph, I've been waiting so long. Senor Perez, is this the man who presented the draft for payment? Hey, uh, si, senora. But he isn't. And what has happened to Joseph? Who? Joseph Ingram, of course. Senor Perez, who is this man? Uh, senora, I heard the citizen had come in this morning with only one person aboard, so I rushed right here to the bank. But you've cashed the draft. What have you done? Killed Joseph for it? Look, madam, I don't know what you're talking about. Just who are you, anyway? I'm Joseph Ingram's wife. Mrs. Ingram? Oh, well, then surely you know he died in that plane crash back in the States. He didn't, and you know it. Joseph wasn't on that plane. He boarded the Sydney in Florida. Now, look, madam, all the newspapers... Joseph and I planned the whole thing. Those highly publicized statements about our divorce were just a cover-up. So nobody would watch or care where I went. He told me from Albuquerque when the plane crashed that he'd meet me here with a certified draft. He was to meet you here. And I know he would have, if he was still alive. Senor Perez, will you call the police? I accuse this man of murdering my husband. Uh, si, senora, if you Call him, call him at once. He was locked it away. I will ring for the guard. Oh, now, uh, just a minute. I, I, I didn't kill him. She killed him. She? Stephanie, his, his secretary. And where is she? She's dead. He killed her. Oh, this doesn't make any sense. Then where is Felix the room? You see, Felix, he, he was killed when he... Yes? You see, it was... It was... That is the girl, senor, waiting outside the door. Under these circumstances, Venezuelan law requires me to hold up payment on the draft pending investigation. And, senor, it is my duty to turn you over to the police. Now, look, look, those people, I had nothing to do with their murders. Have you any proof, senor? 
Have you any witnesses? They were staring at me. They didn't believe me. Of course. <laughs> no one would ever believe me. And it had looked like such a sure thing. I was trapped on a charge of triple murder. Not two million dollars, but triple murder payable to bearer. In just a moment, a word about next week's exciting story of escape. But first, a message from your local Ford dealer. More than 140,000 delighted motorists are already driving the new 50 Ford. Here is what J.B. Spurlock, a salesman, says about his 50 Ford. Anyone who's on the road as much as I am will sure appreciate the relaxing ride of the 50 Ford. You just take the wheel and sail away for hundreds of miles, and you end up almost as fresh as you were when you started. It's not just the comfortable seats alone that are relaxing. It's the quietness of the Ford engine and the fine riding qualities, too. Actually, it feels and holds the road like a much higher-priced car. I wouldn't trade my 50 Ford for anything anywhere near its price class. We Ford dealers hear comments like that every day. But you don't have to take anyone's word for it. Just test drive the 50 Ford yourself. Look up your nearest Ford dealer in the classified phone directory. Or perhaps you know him personally. He'll gladly arrange a test drive in the 50 Ford. Then you can test drive it for comfort, for power, for safety, and for quietness. Test drive it for the new Ford seal, which stamps the 50 Ford as the one fine car in the low price field. Before you buy any car at any price, test drive the 50 Ford at your Ford dealers tomorrow. <laughs> Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented The Sure Thing by John and Gwen Bagney. Featured in the cast were Anthony Ross as the doctor, Jeff Corey as Felix Arouge, Faye Baker as Stephanie, and Ian Wolfe as Joseph Ingram. Also heard were Harry Bartell, Ruth Parrott, Ramsey Hill, and Paul Freed. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are trapped with a lovely but dangerous woman on your own island of paradise. Trapped by overpowering greed for a huge buried treasure. And from the woman and the greed, there is no escape. Next week, we escape with John and Gwen Bagney's exciting tale of a lost paradise. Treasure Incorporated. Goodbye, Dan, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for Pursuit. 10 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. For her, choose the very latest Lady Bulova, only 4250. General Omar N. Bradley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Harvard University President Dr. James B. Conan discuss a vital educational issue just 30 minutes from now. WCBS AM and FM. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to a lush tropical island in the Caribbean. A paradise lost through the overpowering greed of a lovely woman and a dangerous man. As John and Gwen Bagney tell it in their exciting tale, Treasure Incorporated. <laughs> Huh? You're coming with me, aren't you? What for? I feel lucky. Got a feeling today is going to be the day. You said that for months. Why don't you leave me alone? 
She turned away and stared out the window at the jungle. Her face was a dissatisfied mask. She had on that old faded red beach dress. She wore it all the time now. The sloppy pair of slippers. Her hair was pulled back off her neck with a piece of string. Matted. And that wry, crisp figure she once had was going fast. He's up there. Sure, he's up there. He's always up there. I'm not going with you. All right, all right. Stay. Stay, I don't care. You're no help to me anymore. And it won't do you any good to go either. Burn yourself up in this tropic sun and for what? Not while he's up there watching. Always watching. Who are you trying to kid? You know you'll sneak up there to see him the minute I'm gone. And he'll just kick you out again. Shut up. Look at yourself. Not even good enough for that beach comb. Shut up. Shut up! That was Amanda. And I'd once thought her beautiful. And I'd thought this island was beautiful. A paradise. It seemed a million years ago when I first told Brewer about it. All right, Eddie. So you found a pretty island in the West Indies. Now what? Oh, you should see the island, Brewer. More than a square mile of tropical paradise just as nature made it. Complete with native village and volcano. With enough money, I can get a 25-year lease. I've got it all figured out, Brewer. I can make it the best-paying resort in the Caribbean. Oh, I don't know, Eddie. There's so many resorts. What do you think, Amanda? Sounds intriguing. Why not, Paul? Believe me, it's sure a fire with a gimmick like mine. Gimmick? Buried pirate treasure. How do you like that for tourist bait? <laughs> Eddie, I'm afraid you're dreaming. There's never any treasure in those places. Oh, I know that. That's what makes my gimmick so good. I'm going to bury the treasure myself. You are? Oh, sure, nothing too valuable. Just bait, you understand? You know, old Spanish coins, pieces of eight, daggers, bits of old sea chests. Can you get that sort of thing? No, I can get it. I know a guy who handles antiques. He can get it for me. Well, what do you think of it? Is that a gimmick or is that a gimmick? Eddie, you're a genius. <laughs> you like it, Brewer? Well, it sounds good, but I'd have to think about it. How about a drink? Okay. I'll fix this one. Uh, is Scotch all right? Oh, yeah, it's fine. Think you'll go for it, Amanda? He'll go for it. You sure? He didn't sound so positive. Relax, Eddie. Don't worry so much. I'll get your island for you. Not for me, baby. For us. Eddie, take it easy. Remember, I still belong to Brewer. That's Amanda, the kind of woman that always gets what she wants. She got me my island. I started planning the resort. Brewer was to supply the money, and I was to be the front man. It was a great plan it couldn't miss. But I'd figured without Clive. I'll never forget the first time I saw Clive, the only white man on the island. He was bald, but he was young. He had a blonde beard. He was sitting in a tangle of jungle wearing nothing but a pair of white ducks ripped off at the knee and some binoculars slung about his neck with a length of vine. He was painting a sea skin. Hiya, Gillespie's the name, Eddie Gillespie. I've been looking over the island. I know. I've been watching you. Terrific place. Say, uh, that volcano, any chance of it erupting? Oh, no, it's dead. Dead in many years. Well, well, that's a relief. Say, I'm sure surprised to find a white man here. You are? Why? Well, so far away from civilization, nothing to do. And then what are you doing here? Me? <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this island on the map. Really? Yep. See that beat-up building down there by the beach? That once was a fine old plantation house. Yeah. Well, I'm going to turn it into a swanky hotel. Hotel? Sure. Perfect spot for it with all those palm trees around it. And a golf course sweeping up over that hill. Of course, we'll have to clean all those dirty vines out. That dock is a pretty sick-looking thing, but the harbors are natural. What are you looking at through the binoculars? Devil's Cove. Why? What's going on down there? Nothing. I'm painting it. Through binoculars? Why don't you walk down there if you want to paint it? I prefer it this way. <laughs> That's the tropics for you. How lazy can you get? Mr. Gillespie, after you've been here a while, you'll learn to go with the island, not try to change it. No, you just wait and see. When I get through with this place, I'll make Nassau and Jamaica look like Rockaway Beach. Incidentally, those natives, they dress away all the time in those faded old rags. You don't like it? Well, you've got to keep it quaint, you know, as advertised. Got to give the tourists dollar value. We'll fix up the natives with bandanas and bright sashes, necklaces of coral, big earrings, baskets of fruit on their heads. 
course, they'll have to quit wearing those shoes. How about rings through their noses and a bone in their hair? <laughs> you know, I get the feeling you're not going to be very cooperative. It took me years to find a place that was remote from the world, and now that I have, I don't want it destroyed. Destroyed? Why, man, you're crazy. I'm going to do things for this island. I'll have this place humming in no time, and I'll... What's the matter? Don't you think I can do it? No, I don't, and I'll tell you why. Through the centuries, six flags have flown over this island, and each flag brought colonization and industry. Sugar, rum, the leaves of the bay tree, but not one of them could survive. Not one of them could hold back nature. The winds, the damp rot, the jungle, the vines that creep constantly day and night and snaring everything they touch. They couldn't do it, Mr. Gillespie, and neither can you or your hotel. No. You just watch me. I will. But if I thought you had one chance in a million to succeed, do you know what I'd do? What? I'd kill you. In the beginning, he stayed up on top of that hill of his like he owned the world. He ignored me completely until my tractors and bulldozers went to work. And he began to come down more and more. I never heard him coming, and yet he always seemed to be around. And as I ran into trouble... Wind, rain, rot, rats. I had to fight them all. It seemed to amuse him to watch me. Is your paradise fighting your back, Mr. Gillespie? Why don't you go up on your hill and stay there? What a beautiful swimming pool. A symbol of civilization. Do you expect it to last? Why, of course it'll last. Why don't you leave me alone? Be careful. It's bad to lose one's temper. The heat, you know. Yes, heat. Always heat. But I wouldn't give in to it. I drove myself. I drove everybody who worked for me. Come on, boys. We got two more hours of daylight. Get those vines out. They do grow, don't they? What do you want? I like to watch you fight them. It's such a useless task. They'll grow over you in the end, you know. Yeah? Well, I'll civilize this island. I'll show you. Go on and laugh all you want, but you'll see. When any Gillespie starts something, he finishes it. Before the summer was over, we cleaned away all the vines and seeded the golf course. We dynamited the harbor, rebuilt the docks, working 18 hours a day. And then one afternoon, just before the hotel was finished, she arrived. I just knocked off for the day, and I was sprawling in my hammock in front of my hut. Hello, Eddie. Amanda! What are you doing here? You weren't supposed to come until the hotel was open. Aren't you glad to see me? Where's Brewer? How did you get her? In a launch. All the way from New York? <laughs> of course not. We've been anchored at Charlotte and Mania for a week. You didn't break with Brewer, did you? I told you not to break with him until after the hotel was finished. Don't get excited, Eddie. Brewer doesn't even know I'm here. He left this morning for Puerto Rico. On a big deal. Oh. You haven't said you're glad to see me. I've forgotten. It's been so long, I've forgotten how beautiful you are. Eddie... Uh, uh, look, uh, Amanda, you'd better go back if Brewer finds out that you paid What's him. the matter, Eddie? Are you afraid of Brewer? Of course I'm not afraid, but use your head. He financed my island. I'm going to take his girl away from him. Until I get on my feet here, let's keep everything on the up and up. <laughs> What's so funny? You and Brewer. What about Brewer? I was thinking of Brewer keeping everything on the up and up on his side. Look, Eddie, why do you think he set you up on this island? Because he wanted to own a hotel? A resort? What do you mean? It was an investment. <laughs> I'll say it was. Well, if you've got a point, Amanda, get to it. I will, I will. Treasure. That's the point. A million dollars worth of buried treasure. A million? You're crazy. That stuff isn't worth anything. I'm talking about a real treasure. The diamonds, the emeralds, and the pearls. The treasure brewer is going to dig up. You mean there's a million dollars worth of stuff buried on this island? Not yet. But there will be, after Brewer buries it. That doesn't make sense. Why would he do a thing like that? Oh, it makes sense. Brewer always makes sense. You know what he did? He bought a huge lot of stolen jewelry from an international fence. The pieces were so identifiable and so hot he was able to buy it for a song. But he couldn't get rid of it. Then you came along. Eddie Gillespie with his little island and his buried treasure gimmick. Wait a minute. He, he told you this? I was with him. We were on the yacht, not far off the Azores, when we made rendezvous with another boat, took the jewels aboard. And now Brewer's in Puerto Rico, having the stones taken out of their settings. 
man, when the time comes, he's going to dig them up out of your island in a moldy old sea chest in front of witnesses. Got every angle covered. All legitimate. So what? Aren't you interested? Well, if that's what he wants to do, that's his business. I've got the island and I'll have you. Will you? Amanda, what's the matter with you? What's eating you? A million dollars. I wanted it. If you really want me to break with Brewer, you'll get it. What kind of talk is that? I thought you loved me. I do, Eddie. That's the point. I want us to have the money. But we'll have each other. That's not enough, Eddie. I want that minion. I got a good mind that... What, Eddie? There's someone in the brush. Who's that? Who is it? Good evening. Clive, what are you doing here? You're always sneaking around. You're getting angry again. Get out of here. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I was just thinking how much trouble can be caused by a million dollars. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to escape. She went back, and I was left to finish the hotel. But the whole thing had soured for me. All my enthusiasm for the project was gone. But I buried the tourist bait, the pirate treasure. I scattered the pieces of eight, the rusted hinges, all the old relics over the island as per plan. And then I was open for business, and the tourists began to pour in. A change came over Clive. Now he set up his easel down by the dock, and he was gay and gregarious, and I trusted him less and less. He was up to something. And what galled me, the tourists were crazy about him. <laughs> Whatever made you become a beachcomber, Clive? Women? Beautiful women like yourself. They drove me to it. Oh, Clive, I don't believe a word you're saying, but it's fun. Where did you get him, Mr. Gillespie? He's priceless. Clive, why... Uh... I came with the island, standard equipment, along with the volcano and the treasure. Is there really treasure on the island? Well, you found a piece of an old saber yesterday, didn't you? Yes, and my husband found a golden sovereign, but I mean real treasure. Chests full of gold. And... Look for it, Mrs. Chapman. Every cove, every bay. It could be anywhere, on the mountain, in the jungle... Legend says that Captain Kidd himself stopped here, loaded with treasure from the Spanish main. He slew all the Caribs, every single one, buried his loot, and sailed away. And as legend has it, he never came back. Oh, just think of finding it. Then dig, Mrs. Chapman, dig. Take one of our donkeys and a pick and shovel and go out on the trail. Oh, I will. I'm going again this morning. Mr. Gillespie, I'm simply mad about your island. Thank you. Mr. Darling. Oh, oh, there's my husband. Oh, here I am, Fred. Come along, dear. I'll see you boys later. Aren't, uh... Aren't you overdoing it? I'm just being helpful. Adding local color. All that stuff about a legend. You didn't talk that way when I first came here. Mm, things are different now. By the way, when is your pirate coming? Pirate? Brewer, I think you called him. It was two days later that Brewer and Amanda arrived. I was on the veranda watching as the seaplane settled on the water. I watched them walk up to the hotel. Oh, yes. Clive was on the dock painting. He watched them, too. Hello, Eddie. Hello, Eddie. Hi. Good to see you, Eddie. You've done a great job at the hotel. Paradise. That's the name for it, all right. The best investment I ever made, Eddie. Well, I even read about your island in the New York papers. You got a big spread about tourists finding old pieces of eight in an old sea chest. Now, it was positive inspiration, Eddie. Uh, yeah, yeah, it uh, wasn't it? What's the matter? Don't you feel well? You look tired. You've been working too hard. Come on up to the room. We'll have a drink. He was so charming and so relaxed, I began to wonder if Amanda had told me the truth. For the next week or so, I watched him all the time. But he was just a guy on vacation having a whale of a good time. Look at him. The life of a party. Come on outside. I want to talk to you. Now, I think you lied to me. I don't think there is any treasure. Don't be a fool. Of course there is. And when is he going to bury it? I don't know. We'll just have to wait. If I find out that you lied... Eddie, you don't believe I... Maybe you're trying to pull some kind of a double cross on me. Let's go back, Eddie. <laughs> Well, 
This is the hard way to get exercise. I think it's out of the future. Well, you want exercise? Why don't you come out and dig with us, Brooke? Ah, uh, well, what did he say? Oh, that's what you've been saying all week. Look at my waistline. I've taken off an inch. Why don't you come tomorrow, Mr. Brewer? It's lots of fun. I like to sleep in the morning. Oh, come on. Sure, come on. Be a sport. Okay. I'll dig with you tomorrow morning. Who knows? I might be lucky. Tomorrow morning? <laughs> that means he'll have to bury it tonight. Yeah. You'll have to watch him. Don't let him out of your sight. I waited outside until every window was dark, until the hotel was quiet. I waited and waited. But he didn't come. And still I waited until... Still up, Eddie? Clive! You might as well get your sleep. He isn't going to bury the treasure tonight. What do you mean? How do you know? Because he's already buried it. Well, you're crazy. He couldn't have. I've watched him constantly. Apparently not close enough. What about the hour just before dinner when you and the girl were on the other side of the volcano? Where did he bury it? Tell me. In Devil's Cove. The Devil's Cove? Oh, there's no point in your going there now. You don't think I'd leave it there, do you? I dug it up. I know I couldn't trust you. All the talk about getting away from civilization, you know, better than anybody else. Oh, I'm not going to keep the jewels. What would I do with money? Yeah? And where are they? I buried them again. You what? You ought to thank me. I'm making an honest man out of you, Eddie. You advertise buried treasure on your island? Well, now you have it. Like you said, got to give the tourist dollar value. Why? Just think, tomorrow or the day after, or next month, one of your tourists will dig it up as advertised. Clive, look, don't do this to me. If you don't want the jewels, just tell me where they are. I'll give you anything, only just tell me. And miss all the fun? Oh, no. <laughs> Morning, Eddie. Good morning. Great day, isn't it? You're coming out the diggings with us? No, uh, no, Brewer. I've got some work to do here. Say, you look tired, Eddie. You work too hard. You ought to take it easy. Have some fun. Relax. Relax. I wondered how relaxed he'd be when all he dug up was dirt. I watched him go off down the trail with the other guests. I tried to concentrate on my work. The hotel was quiet. Everyone was at the diggings, but I couldn't think. I was checking supplies in the wine cellar when Amanda came back. You should have been there, Eddie. Oh, you should have seen his face when he found it was gone. Where'd you put it, Eddie? I haven't got it. Of course you have. I told you, I don't have it. What are you trying to do? Double cross me. Fuller! Paul, I... I'll take care of you later, Amanda. But, Paul, he forced me to tell him... She's lying. All right, Eddie. Where is it? I don't know. Come on, Eddie, talk. I haven't got it, I tell you. Clive took it. Clive, who's that? Clive, the beachcomber. He saw you bury it. He dug it up and buried it again. Nobody saw me bury it except me. Wait a minute, will you? I tell you, it's true. Look. Where'd you put it? Look. Look. No use. I haven't got it. You'll tell me the truth if I have to beat you. Amanda. I had to do it. He killed it. Don't worry. Everyone's at the diggings. No one could have heard it. Oh, Eddie, your face. What do we do with him? Well, when everyone's asleep, we'll get rid of him. I'm glad I killed him, Eddie. Now it all belongs to us. I haven't got it. You mean you were telling the truth about that beach coma? Yeah, yeah, he moved it. He buried it some other place. Because he wants one of the tourists to find it. It's part of his plan to get even with me. We can't let anyone else find it, Eddie. We've got to do something. Oh, my head. Eddie, listen to me. We've got to get rid of the tourists. Yeah, yeah. I've got to get rid of them. Every one of them. We waited until siesta When all the guests would be asleep in their rooms Then we went to the construction shed For the dynamite that was left over From blasting the harbor We loaded it and Brewer onto a donkey And went up the back trail to the volcano crater I pushed Brewer into the crater Planted the dynamite inside the top edge Amanda strung the wire down the slope To a cave on the east side of the island I went down to the cave. My island was asleep. I had my hand on the plunger. I was ready to throw it, and then I realized fully what I was about to do. With one gesture, I'd be destroying everything I'd worked so hard for. Hey, what's the matter? I can't do it. Give it to me. No, Amanda, no. I sat on the side of the mountain and watched the island become alive with frantic, frightened people. They streamed out of the hotel, half-dressed, clutching their belongings. They tripped over one another in their frenzy to get to their boats, terrified of a dead volcano. Our threatened eruption was a complete success. 
By nightfall, there wasn't a tourist on the island. Even the natives had scurried away in their canoes like so many frightened rats. And there were just the three of us left. Amanda, Clive, and me. How will we get the treasure? We can't dig up a whole island. We won't have to. Any man that's got that much loot stashed away will dig it up himself. You can't tell me money doesn't mean anything to him. We'll wait. And we did. We waited and got on each other's nerves. We waited until we couldn't stand it anymore. But Clive didn't make a move to dig it up. It was clear he'd never go near it as long as we were there. Our only escape was to dig. We started in systematically, on the east side of the island, then the north. In the rain, in the wind, in the boiling sun. This is heater. I can't take it anymore, Eddie. I'm tired. I never thought I'd hear you say that. This was all your idea, don't forget. I don't care, Eddie. Why don't you give it up? You get away from me. What? Go and let him have it or no? So that's what you want, is it? It's Clive now. Uh, you and Clive. Well, you won't get your treasure that way. I'm staying and I'm going to dig without you. I'm going to dig until I drop. It was hot. It was always hot. My eyes ached from the glare of the sun, but I forced myself to keep going. For days I'd been digging near the old sugar mill. But today I had a feeling I'd be lucky. My pick hit something hard. I dropped to my knees and furiously began to claw the dirt with my hands. There was only rock, a big rock. I moved it aside and there it was. A pearl. One single pearl framed by the fresh imprint of a sea chest. And then I heard him from a long way off. Clive, and he was laughing at me. He was watching me through those binoculars of his and he was laughing at me. And suddenly I knew what his game was. That's why I hadn't found the treasure in all this time, because he'd kept moving it. And he'd left a pearl behind this time to tell me he'd done it. I knew then what I had to do. I had to kill him. I went up the hill by the back trail. And just at the top, I stopped and took a firmer grip on my pick. Clive's back was to me. He was sitting exactly the way he had been the first time I saw him, in a tangle of vines painting through binoculars. I crept up to him. I raised my pick and brought it down with all my strength. <laughs> but it was too late. He'd sensed me and ducked the blow. The pick had ripped through the canvas. In fury, I raised the strike it again in my hand, froze in midair as I stared at the torn canvas. It was a picture of me. And the pick had pierced my chest. Me, holding a pearl in my hand, and the look on the face he painted was horrible. The pick slid out of my hands. Here's your pick, Eddie. Take it. You'll need it. Take it, Eddie, and dig. And by the way, I had to kick Amanda out again today. Keep her home, will you? <laughs> That was months ago. How many months? I lost count. The jungle has claimed the island again, just like he said it would. The damp rot, the hurricanes, the vines. The hotel sags on its timbers, and the big front door is gone. The last wind took most of the roof. And there are bougainvillea roots growing up through the cracks in the swimming pool. The jungle has claimed Amanda, too. She's lost interest in everything, except Clive. And he won't have her. She doesn't care about the treasure anymore. She won't dig. But not me. The jungle's not going to get me. Nothing is going to stop Eddie Gillespie. Every day I dig. Once in a while I hear him up on top of the hill laughing. And I know he's moved it again. But someday I'll beat him to it. Someday I'll find it. Yeah. Someday. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robson. Tonight we have presented Treasure Incorporated by John and Gwen Bagney. Featured in the cast were Frank Lovejoy as Eddie, John Hoyt as Clive, Mary Lansing as Amanda, and Harry Bartell as Brewer. 
Also heard were Eileen Prince and Paul Fries. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are sitting in a cheerless gray cell, staring at the rain through the small barred window above your head and struggling desperately to keep your sanity. For in 12 hours, you must die or escape. Next week, we escape with James Poe's seething tale of blasphemous terror and violent death. Present tense. Starring Vincent Price. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. It's no joke when an accident happens to you, and an accident can happen to you. This winter, take time to be careful. Whether you're driving or walking in traffic, be cautious. Cross streets with care. Drive safely. Keep your wits and windshield clear. In traffic, walking or driving, be careful. Be sure to join us at this same time next week when we offer you Escape, starring Vincent Price. And now stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape into the mind of a man who has been sentenced to die. A man who attempts to refuse the bitter fate society has imposed upon him. As James Poe tells it in his seething tale of violent death, present tense. Starring Vincent Price. Through the dim pain, the cold, dark land wheels away. And the hills beyond, below the stars, are black and sharp. Dead hills, dark sky. Cold steel below my feet. Cold as the face of the officer at my side. Cold as the cuffs which link my arm to his. Which join us on this journey to the prison where I die. Want a cigarette? No. Go on, take one. No, I, I don't use them. Oh. Has this happened to you before? What? Being handcuffed to a murderer. Has it happened to you before? Sure, plenty of times. To an axe murderer? Yeah, there's nothing special, brother. Lots of guys axe their wives, lots of them. I could have escaped after it happened, but I didn't, and now it's too late. Late. Late, ever too late. Never too late, too late, too late. Escape. Escape. If the train were to be wrecked, if the detective were to be killed. Late. Late. The sweet escape, the light escape, the crash escape. No! Oh, no, no, no! The darkness. Where am I? The cars must have gone down the gully. No lights and those people in pain. This thing fastened to my wrist went halfway through the glass of the door. Keep back, keep back from his blood. I... I don't seem to be hurt. No broken bones. The paper. Now the, the key in his pocket, his bloody pocket, and the cuffs are off. His gun and, and the wallet. His face. His face is gone. His own mother wouldn't know him. I'm free. Fire. Fuel oil. I must get away. Here. My ring onto his finger. There, that completes it. Yes. Up Beverly Glen, about sunset. I'll show you where. 
about the big train wreck? Yes. Understand almost a hundred were killed. Here you are. Keep the change. Thanks. My home. It looks so small, so shabby. No one took care of it during the trial. No one cared. No one. No one cares now, but that's good. I like that. I'll be alone, and I won't let the neighbors see me, and I'll sleep and figure out where I go next. The light. Someone's in there. No, it can't be. She's dead. I know she's dead. Want another bottle of beer, honey? Yeah, sure. Cold. You bet so. That's right. I'm not. You said a mouthful, Lord. Her husband and I was never able to make me feel like this. Take your man, dude. He could do is sit around and write those... How did they trick me into imagining the murder? I, I am innocent. I thought myself guilty, and now I am truly guilty, and never in my life have I felt so innocent. Like a dream, like a nightmare, the confession, the conviction, the sentence, and now... Once more, dark night, cold steel, the sound of wheels, just as I lived it before. Why, even the cold face of the silent officer at my side, hard, cold face, so much like that other face. Want a cigarette? No. Go on, take one. No, I don't use them. Oh. Has this happened to you before? Uh, what? Being handcuffed to a murderer. Has it happened to you before? Oh, sure, plenty of times. To an axe murderer? Yeah, you're nothing special, brother. Lots of guys axe their wives. Lots of them. But were you ever cuffed to an axe murderer who killed two people, two people at once? What are you talking about? My sin, my crime, what I did, I killed them both. Glam. Like, take it easy, brother. They only kill your wife. Just her, just one, that's all. Uh... For some days now. And beyond the barred window, the leaden sky bleeds sorrow on the barren land, the lonely land, the land beyond the prison wall. The sky was blue when first I came here, blue, so blue. And now it has become as the walls of my cell, of all our cells. Dark, cheerless cells, these lifeless cells, these cells of men who wait to die. That wet sky, gray sky, cheerless sky. But it is beautiful. I have 12 hours left of life, 12 hours left to live. Beautiful sky, beautiful, beautiful, wet and fresh and alive. Oh, rather would I spend eternity at a well's bottom with, with, with one patch of that to gaze upon. 
Justin, leave this life. Then leave this earth. Then leave this sky. I believe it, I must. The guard told me no man has ever escaped Dan Clayton's death row. Blocks and bars, guards and guns lie between me and the world beyond. No escape, not from here. Wouldn't it be nobler to gamble my life in bold attempt and lay it down in reckless resignation, eh? Oh, now to get out of this super-guarded area. Oh! Oh, God! God! Hey, 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 fight that. Fight that. Cut it out. Oh, what's wrong? What's the matter with you? My, my, my gut! Here! It's killing me! Your oh. gut, huh? Well, I'll call a medic. <laughs> As I press you, tell me where it hurts. Everywhere in hell. Oh, all over down here. There. Oh, don't touch that place again. Call the ambulance. All right. This man's got appendicitis. Oh, do something. Well, what do I do? Why didn't they send somebody with you? The interns are all tied up. They're giving shots today. Well, he's acting kind of crazy. Let's get him over to the hospital block. Now, hurry. Can't drive any faster. My windshield steamed up. Oh, wipe it. You got a rag? Yeah, here. You could use my handkerchief. Okay, Ooh. pal. Give him the handkerchief. Oh, my God. What the... Keep right on driving through the gate or the top of your head comes off. You won't get away with this? I will. I'm betting my life that I will. How far back is the prison? About 15 miles. At least that. Okay, pull over. I'm taking her from here. And you too. I want your money, your clothes. And then you can walk back and explain about me. Explain about him. They won't find the ambulance for days. Not at the bottom of that canyon. Now I... I cross the border on foot. And into Mexico. <laughs> You drink, senor. Oh, thank you. Uh, say, uh, when does the next bus leave for Mexico City? At 12 o'clock, senor. A little card bought in a back room with no questions asked, and I become a tourist. Four days' growth of beard, and I become poor. An empty suitcase with a butterfly net strapped to its outside, and I become a source of amusement. A funny, dumb gringo... And who looks with suspicion on the funny, dumb, gringo tourist who is poor? Mexico City is beautiful, but not when you are hungry. Not when you are an American who is hungry. Americans aren't supposed to be hungry. What can I do? All I know is writing, the writing of poetry. There, there is one place I might sell some poems. Pollen. His magazine prints some English stuff. Perhaps... Well, why not? I have three pesos left. Buy some paper, a pencil, sit in the park, write, and storm the bastion. Ah? Huh? Yeah? Huh? Yeah, that's a scoot here. Do you like them, Mr. Pollen? Well, I, I, well, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Lucida... I have some points here. Oh, let me see. The river doubles, dreaming droppled, fester passion of my soul. Ah, muy bueno. Yeah, yeah, that is just what I thought. You are too kind. The poet should read his own work. <laughs> that, that drip, sweet droplet. Passion goblet, fate thy roll. Uh, uh, Lucita likes your stuff. A rare woman. And and I like what Lucita likes. Aha. Uh -huh. She says we do a book of your stuff. Oh? So here's an abound. Too much. It's a... When the book. That it is. Right. Got the poem? I'll get them. Your name is? Miss. No good to doubt. So true. I'll make a new one. Please do. And so? Good day, and I'll be back. Yes, that is With it. the poem. Miles below, the bleak, 
brown mountains, the desert yellow and red. My own, my native land. My advance money went for new clothing and a round-trip plane ticket to Los Angeles and my new lease on life. In a small file under the eaves of the little house in Beverly Glen, there are poems, more than a thousand of them, poems which no one has ever seen, poems written in the evenings after work on Sundays. Now, with the beard and the hat and the glasses, no one will recognize me. A cane. I ought to carry a cane, too. Get the poem. Does someone live there in the house? Has someone bought it? <laughs> no matter. Get the poems and then get back to Mexico City. Hmm. <laughs> someone is living here. I wonder who. The hedge is trimmed. And my, my hammock. Someone's put on a new canvas cover. Mister, what do you want here? Uh, are you the lady at the house? Ah, who's that at the door? Some creep with a beard. Yeah, I'm the lady of the house, but I don't want to buy anything. Well, what is it, Santa Claus? What do you want? Are you the man of the house? Yeah, I'm the man of the house. That's sweet me. <laughs> I'll say. So what of it? I'm, uh, I'm making a survey. I'd like to ask a few questions. May I come in? Well, I don't know. Ah, let him. What's the difference? Thank you. First, your name. Name? Yes, please. Press me. Hey, where's he going? Mister, what do you want in my kitchen? The cleaver, Mary. Don't you know me? Mary. Hey, who are you, mister? Look close, Mary. <laughs> the cleaver. Put it down. Know me? Know the man you tricked into San Quentin? No, don't. Put down that... Conviction, sentence, transportation, and oh, again, again, the death cell as before. But when I came here, they promised I could keep the beard. They promised I could keep the beard. And it's gone. Gone. I can't remember where. What's that? Who's coming next? Ready? Ready. It's time to go, my son. Time to go. You've refused my help up to now. But perhaps you'd like to walk with me. Rather beside you, Padre, than beside one of these mercenaries. My legs. The muscles quiver, not with fear, no, but with the desire to feel themselves moving, straining, acting... While yet there is time, I'm not afraid, but this body, I hate the thought of its being killed by these men, my beautiful body, soon it will be dead, cold, rotting, dead, it will rot. No, they must not do this to me. You must be brave, my son. My body, years I spent with the great corporeal master, the yogi, learning my bodily purpose, my bodily care, the use of willpower to control my body, the yogi. My teacher, yes, I shall use yoga to spend my breathing and become invulnerable to their gas, to spend my body functions to the point of death and fool their doctor, of course. Oh, yes, the greatest escape of them all, and this time I must succeed. All right, here we are. The room is... Somehow I had imagined it would be larger. And here is the chair. Yes, strap. Hood. All right, now just sit down. And over there, the glass. They get a small pane with the dark faces seen dimly through. The witnesses. I lay your arms along these. The whole room is like some strange sort of time machine. 
machine for launching a man into another dimension. (laughs) So true. I best begin to prepare myself. Relax. Relax. Must relax. It won't be easy. Have you any last words, my son? Yes, one request. Do not allow my poor body to be dissected or embalmed, but on the third day after my death, cremate it. That will be arranged as you desire. Thank you. God be with you, my son. Remember what Christ said to the two criminals. In this day shalt thou be with me in heaven. Now move your head forward a little. All right, put the hood down. There. Now, when you hear the pellets drop into the acid, don't try any tricks. Just breathe deeply, see? Fumes don't hurt, see? You just cooperate with us. Make it easy on yourself, pal. You know what I mean? vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. I will myself to consciousness in six hours' time. Where am I? Dark here and cold. So cold. I... I must get up and see... Oh, the prison morgue. It worked. But I'm cold, so cold. What's this on my toe? A tag. Too dark to read it, but I know what it says. It has my name, prison number, time of execution, yes. And now to look around. Because the next step must be played just right. And this should be it. A coffin crate, ready for shipping. Some cadaver being returned to a sentimental family. Well, I ought to be just right. With him on my slab, my tag on his toe, and the most perfect escape of all time underway, here we go. I will my body to return from its state of suspended animation and to come immediately out of trance when next this coffin shall be opened. (sighs) Hello, old man. Let's see. 
No, it's going. Well, let's hope he's out for a while. This must be the workroom. Light hanging over the work table and... There, a locker. Oh, with a suit. Fine. And here in the... In the desk. Might there not be some sort of... Oh, yes, here. A petty cash box. And it's quite full. And the old boy apparently doesn't believe in banks. <laughs> and now... And now that Lazarus has returned from the dead, this newspaper, Dateline, I was executed four days ago. Now I find myself resurrected in Indianapolis, Indiana. Los Angeles, California. This is Los Angeles. You can claim your baggage in the station or on the platform. I return to my home. Beautiful time to return home. My old hammock is there, and my flowers, my yard. Oh, the house is empty. The lawyer said he had it cleaned up. Oh, my books, my pictures. Here's my old pipe. I haven't smoked it in years. Mary didn't like it. But now she's gone. I don't hate her anymore. Tobacco's still fairly fresh. So the pipe. There's that detective story I never got to finish. Now I'll have time. Now I'll have lots of time. Time to smoke and read and write and rest. Oh, the sun's almost out. Twilight. Wonderful time to get outside. Cool, sweet air. Wonder what kind of birds those are. My hammer. Oh, it's so nice. Like the pipe. And, oh, relax. Wish I could remember what page I was on, but no matter. I can begin again. I've got all the time in the world. The rest of my life. <laughs> Birds. And the sun is slipping out of sight. Death of the sky. I read the sky. Oh, those clouds. So oh, lovely. What's that? <laughs> birds playing in the fish pond. Look at them. Happy birds. That hissing. The neighbor is turning on his lawn sprinkling system. Lie here and smell the cool air. Evening coming on. Sky grows darker. Lie in the gathering twilight. Death of the day, birth of the night. Sweet softness of the summer night coming. Soon the star. Oh, it's lovely, heavenly, just like heaven. Lie and swing. Rock and rock. To and so. By the authority vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Present Tense by James Poe. Starring Vincent Price as Roger. Featured in the cast were Charles McGraw as Fred Sneed, Joan Banks as Mary, Harry Bartell as the doctor, and Ben Wright as Pollen. Also heard were Tom Tully, William Lally, Jeff Corey, and Paul Fries. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week. You are alone at the controls of an experimental rocket aircraft. About to be hurled 40 miles out from the Earth's surface into the limitless boundaries of space, into a nothingness from which there may be no escape. Next week, we escape with Graham Doerr's imaginative and widely discussed story of a rocket pilot who receives the strangest and most terrible warning in the history of man, the outer limit. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, 
when once again we offer you Escape. When Bob Hope visits Bing Crosby on Bing's CBS show tomorrow night, they'll be singing a duet called Have I Told You Lately. That's a good theme for Bing and Bob, for you know and I know that when the two lads get together, the gags about each other's shortcomings fly thick and fast. Tomorrow night, with National Sauerkraut Week as the springboard, Bing and Bob promise one of their most hilarious meetings. So don't miss the CBS Bing Crosby show, which is heard on most of these same stations. Now stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight... We escape with the pilot of an experimental jet rocket aircraft, about to be hurled 40 miles out from the Earth's surface into the limitless boundaries of space, where he receives the most terrible warning in the history of man, from which there is no escape. As Graham Dorr tells it in his thrilling and widely discussed story, The Outer Limit. Starring Frank Lovejoy. Zero minus twenty five. Zero minus five. All right, man. Settle down. I settle down, man. Okay, Colonel. Yes, sir. All of you will want to know why we took you what out of whatever warm bed you were in. You got a reason. The RJX-1. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The RJX-1. The top, top secret experimental rocket jet aircraft. We've been babying it, nursing it, staying up nights with it for 16 months now. This morning, Major Westfall is going to wean it. Bill is going to take her out and beat her up to death. I can't impress upon you men how... Extraordinary this flight is. It's an eight-rocket ship. That's what I said, eight rockets. Eight rockets designed to take man into areas of space that have never been explored before. And at a rate of speed to which no pilot has yet been subjected. Some of you men have already flown many times the speed of sound, so I don't have to tell you very much. Yo? Yes, Colonel? You'll lead the F-86s. You and the other three jet boys will be Bill's chase planes. We want observation at 35,000 feet. Yes, sir. Okay, here's how it plays. Pull the curtains on the map, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. You see it circled here, your rendezvous point. We designate it point X. It's roughly over Boulder Dam. Zero hour is 0900. Joe, you and your jets will take off at zero minus 15. You got that? Yes, sir. You F-86s will make conventional climbs to 30,000 feet. Rendezvous at point X and call in to meet control at 35,000 feet. Right, Joe? That's cut the Colonel. Oh, no, wait a minute. Not quite. Now we hear about the weather, Pete. Yes, Colonel. Well, the weather's very pretty out, boys. All clear, ceiling unlimited. Winds aloft at 10,000, 80 mph, 25,000, 140 mph, 40,000, 150 mph. Estimated temperature, 45 below at 40,000 feet. There's some scattered clouds northwest of Point X at 15,000 feet. Stratus at 30,000 feet, 30 miles east of Point X, east. We expect no change for three hours. That's it, sir. Okay, Pete. Joe, you and your boys go unwrap your F-86s. Have a nice time. Yes, sir. Come on, boys. Major Westfall. Major Westfall, stick around. I want to talk to you. Okay, Hank. How you feeling, Bill? No <laughs> worry. You worried, Hank? Don't worry. Look, Bill. You've got only ten minutes of rocket fuel. Get rid of those jets before you fire the rockets. Fire only one, one rocket, rocket at a time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Now, look, I'll be listening in on the public address of control. I won't bother you until you're airborne. It'll be between you and the tower until then. All right, don't worry, Hank. 
I'm going to fly that baby higher and faster than anybody ever did before, just like you said. I'm going to take it up and I'm going to bring it back. And then you and I'll have dinner together. Hmm? Zero minus three. Zero minus... Good morning, Colonel. Mr. Hargrove. He'll be here at the control with me. It's all right with you, Colonel. I wouldn't have it any other way. You've checked the communications equipment, Sergeant? Oh, yes, sir. Major Westfall has been assigned a special radio frequency at 3970. I've... Good, good. You'll take care of it, Sergeant. We don't want it to poop out or anything like that, do we? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, no, sir. Sir. Hargo, I got a thing on my mind. That boy in the plane you geniuses designed is my best boy. It's our best plane, Colonel. It better be. Now it's your turn. What do you got on your mind? Everything's in proper order, Colonel. Recording equipment, the television cameras in the cockpit, everything. Every known scientific device, even some unknown. They've been very... You're talking about a man, Hargrove. That's all I really want to get back out of this. What about the man? There may be one difficulty. Tell me about it. I'd like to know. The takeoff. With all that load. The jets, the rockets. All at maximum fuel capacity. Never been tested that way before. Go on, Mr. Hargrove. Well, it's just that Major Westfall has only 6,000 feet to get his ship airborne. If he accelerates from zero to 160 miles per hour in 6,000 feet, he should be airborne in seven seconds. Seven seconds, that makes zero plus G. Yes, Colonel. Beyond zero plus G? Well, beyond that, we... We don't know. We just don't know. Thanks. Thanks for everything, Mr. Hargrove. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Flip your switch on Major Westfall. I hear he's got a swell program. Flip them all, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. RJX-1 to tower. Any change in weather? Tower to RJX-1. Barometer reading 29.7. Set your altimeter accordingly. Roger. Wind 15 miles from south. Take off runway 27. Runway 27. Got it. Zero minus 130. Zero RJX-1 one to control. 30. Over. Control to RJX-1. Go ahead. This is just for you, Hank. Cabin pressure, okay. Oxygen pressure, okay. All right, all right. Get off the dime, kid. <laughs> Take a pill, Hank. You'll need it to settle your stomach. Zero minus one. Zero RJX-1 minus to crew one. chief, over. Crew chief to RJX-1. Go ahead. I'm ready to fire. Hold it. Okay. All set to fire. Clear? Clear. Guarding right, Jet. Guarding left, Jet. Zero minus thirty seconds. Tower to RJX one. Zero minus thirty seconds. RJX one to tower. Go ahead. Western Airlines convoy reported over Ventura. Got it. Eastbound constellation at seventeen thousand over Salt Lake. Roger. Western Airlines DC four on base lake at one thousand over Burbank. The rest of the air is yours. Thank you so much. Zero minus ten. RJX one to tower. Ready eight. for takeoff. Tower to RJX-1. Six, Clear for takeoff. Five. Good luck, Bill. Four. Three. Two. One. Zero. He's rolling. Zero plus. He's rolling. B. C. D. E. Bill, F, lift it. G, lift it. A. Lift it. Bill made it, Mr. Hargo. RJX-1 to control. RJX-1 to control. Come in. Control to RJX-1. Go ahead. Everything's great, Hank. It's a doll, baby. Hey, you must have been kidding with that takeoff, weren't you? It took that long to get off. That makes it a takeoff. How fast are you climbing, kid? 1,700 a minute airspeed, 550. Retract your landing gear. It'll help. Oops, sorry. Call me at 20,000. Heading is 87. Everything is real good. Come in, Hank. How do you feel? I like it here. Pressure okay? Okay. F-86 leader to control. F-86 to control. Come in. Control to F-86 leader. Go ahead. F-86 observing RJX-1. He's really tearing, Colonel. Over point exit 35,000. On schedule, Joe? 
On schedule. RJX-1 to control. RJX-1 to control, come in. Control to RJX-1, go ahead, Bill. 40,000 feet, Hank. Still it down, baby? Still is. Ready to pressurize. Can you hear me okay, Hank? Coming in fine. Pressurize. Ready to prime rocket system in five seconds. Prime. Dropping right jet. Dropping left jet. All clear. Good luck, Bill. Firing number one rocket. Fired. Oh! Taken back. Firing number two rocket. Fired. Hey, hey! Okay, Bill, what is it? Bill! Bill, are you receiving me? Control to RJX-1. Come in. Come in, RJX-1. Hello, Bill, come in. Control to F-86 leader. Control to F-86 leader. Come in. F-86 leader to control. Go ahead. What about it, Joe? F-86 observing RJX-1. RJX-1 at approximately 60,000 feet. Maintaining a heading of north-northwest. I can barely make him, Colonel. Try calling. Okay. F-86 leader to RJX-1. F-86 to RJX-1. Come in. Come in, RJX-1. Come in. Mr. Hargrove. F-86 yes, to RJX-1. Share it with me, Mr. Hargrove. F-86 to Sit RJX-1. Sit here and run your fingers through your hair and Come in, RJX-1. wait and think about it and share it with me. F-86 to RJX-1. F-86 leader to control. F-86 leader to control. Come in. Go ahead, F-86 leader. We've lost him, Colonel. Stay up there, Joe, for as long as you can. What do we do now, Colonel? I just told you, Mr. Hargrove. We wait. You and me, we wait. We've lost him, Colonel. You haven't lost me. I can hear you, Joe. Stay up there, Joe, for as long as you can. Hello? 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 I'll try another frequency, Joe. RJX-1 to F-86. Can you make me? RJX-1 to F-86. Come in. Come in. No good, huh? I'll switch back to Channel Charlie. I still can't get you, Joe. I'll keep sending. Firing number eight rocket. Fired. Oh, brother! Oh, brother! RJX-1 to all you ships at sea, to all you people anywhere. This is Bill Westfall approaching 210,000 feet. That's 40 miles straight up in the air, all you people, and that's where I am. You never saw anything like it. No clouds. A color no one ever named before. In silence. Eight rockets roaring at my tail and I can't hear them. Their sound will never reach me at 1,800 miles an hour. Silence so complete that the ticking of the clock on my instrument panel is a hammer in my brain. Silence. Otherwise, nothing. Nothing except... No, nothing at all. Wait a minute. Yes, there is something all right at two o'clock high. Oh, that's really something, brother. Maybe a flying disc, and this is a big one. Spinning like a top, and it's coming toward me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Listen. Listen. Something has just happened. Something, a missile, a shot, maybe, through the canopy. My pressure is going down. Something is happening to me. This, this thing, it's like a magnet. I'm being pulled toward it. 
I've lost control of my ship. I've no control. I'm going through decompression. I'm on the verge of unconsciousness. I'm blocking out. I'm flat. Can you hear? You are listening to The Outer Limits, starring Frank Lovejoy in another thrilling adventure on Escape. He had only ten minutes fuel. He's three hours overdue. Well, that's that, Colonel. But wait some more, Mr. Hargrove. There's no point to it. May I make a suggestion, Colonel? What? Give it up. Make your report to Washington. What about you, Mr. Hargrove? To be frank with you, Colonel, in another 16 months, there'll be another play. The RJX-2. In the Army, will give us another man to fly it. Not till we're certain about this man, and we're not certain. What do you propose to do? The things that are in the manual. We'll organize search parties and put spotter planes up in the air. Maybe Bill came down on the ocean. We'll call the Navy in. Colonel, if the RJX-1 came down on the ocean, it would sink in three minutes. You know it had no life preserver equipment on it. The added weight of the... We'll call the Navy in. Whatever you say, Colonel. My guess is... What's your guess, Mr. Hargrove? My guess is that sometime, somewhere, on some beach or in some field, someone will pick up a piece of torn metal. That someone will be holding what's left of the RJX-1. the Space Patrol ship S2J3. Am I in communication with you? Can you understand me? Are we in contact? Can you understand now what I am saying to you? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, I can understand you. Earthman, your brain is in turmoil, is it not? It has great difficulty in accepting what you see. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Accept it. What you see here exists. Uh, all this? This exists? It exists, Earthman. The spaceship you're on exists. Those jet dynamos you see before you exist. Jet dynamos driven by the harness power of a thousand suns. Listen, Earthman. Listen to them. happened as you listened, Earthman. We have flung ourselves 10,000 miles into space. What do you say to that, Earthman? Why, well, I... I don't know what to say. It's beyond the conception of your Earth brain. Then conceive this. Try to move, Earthman. You're not bound in any way. Try to move. No brain. It's impossible for you to move. There's a screen of force aimed at you. Now it's turned off. You may move about, Earthman. Proceed, uh, Zeglon. Yes, Commander. Earthman, I perceive that your intellect now accepts the fact. You are aboard Space Patrol Ship S2J3. I am Captain Zeglon of the Galactic Guard. Galactic? Galactic Guard? The Guardian of the Galaxy. The Guardian of the Universes. The instrument the Brotherhood of Worlds has set up in defense against such a civilization as yours. What puzzles you, Earthman? Well, I... I uh... Well, I, I can't see you. I can feel that you're here, but I can't see you. There is no necessity for you to see us. It is sufficient that we communicate with each other. Yes, but talking to you is... Well, it's not like talking. It's, uh... Well, it's uh, as if it were all happening inside my brain. It is. That is how I'm reaching you, by telepathy. Do you remember what happened to you before you blacked out? Yes, I think so. Uh, there was a sharp sound, like a bullet hitting the canopy. It was not a bullet. It was a ray. It was necessary to stop your flight. 
We have so much to tell you. Well, first tell me about my ship. Is it lost? No. It is such a crude little ship. Crude? Easy for us to repair. It will be returned to you. And you will return to Earth. Because you are the Earth's only hope of survival. Hope of survival? What do you mean? I will show you. What you see on this screen before you is a panorama of your own universe. Far greater in scope than an Earthman has ever seen before. Observe. Observe where the line is pointing. Planet 3, Star 5, Galaxy C, Sector K. Is, uh, is that the Earth? No. That dot, that speck you see revolving in the vastness, is your sun. A star whose surface is 12,000 times that of your Earth. Your Earth is not even visible here. What? How did you know we even existed? That was our problem. We first became aware of your planet when we found atomic dust in the upper atmosphere. We traced it to your Earth. It was that important to you? Quite. We determined that you were setting off atomic bombs. That's why the Galactic Council has quarantined you. Quarantined? I don't understand. How? How are we uh, quarantined? We have sealed off your planet from the rest of space. We have surrounded it with a force screen. When that screen has accumulated enough particles of atomic dust, your Earth will explode. Your civilization, you, all life will disappear forever. Listen to me, Earth man. Listen. We've had our own wars. Wars that almost destroyed our civilization. But we have finally outlawed war throughout space, including Earth. Now listen carefully, Earthmen. If you continue to make atom bombs and hydrogen bombs, each many times more powerful than the last, and if you start making war with them, exploding them, it would upset the balance of the entire universe, throw all space into chaos. This, of course, we cannot allow. And the force screen with which we have surrounded the Earth will prevent it by exploding the Earth itself. Remember then, Earthmen... If you start an atomic war, the Earth will at once be completely destroyed. Warn them, Earthman. Release him, Zegon. Yes, Commander. Earthman, you will rise from your seat and open that door. Descend those stairs, Earthman. You will now enter the chamber to your left. There is your ship. Get into it, Earthman. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. While we were communicating, the patrol ship has returned to where we picked you up. And now you will be propelled toward Earth. Close your canopy. Open aperture. Warn them, Earthman. Warn them. Fire! RJX-1 to tower. RJX-1 to tower. Come in. RJX-1 to tower. Come in, tower. Tower to funny man. You loaded, kid. How did you get in on this frequency? Listen, this is RJX-1. RJX-1 coming in for landing. Give me landing instructions. Tower to funny man. Impossible that you're RJX-1. He's ten hours overdue. Get away from the area. Area cleared for bomber practice approaches. This is Major Westfall and RJX-1. Come on, kid, give me landing instructions. I have no fuel, I'm gliding. What? Hey! Hey, yeah, I see you now, Major. Wait a minute, I'll restrict the area. Okay, RJX-1, go ahead. Approximately six miles north of field, clear area for ten miles. Being cleared. What's your altitude? Ten thousand. Estimate six minutes to land. Tower to RJX-1. You are clear to land. Runway 9. Wind east-southeast 15. Roger. Coming down. Hi, Hank. Bill, Bill, what happened? Hank, you won't believe it, but you've got to. 
I know you won't believe it. It'll knock you over. Now, Ed, just take it easy, Bill. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Have the ship gone over by Geiger counters for radioactivity and seal it. What? Oh, yes, Hank. You better mount a 24-hour guard on it. Look, what did you run into? Plenty. Listen to me, Hank. They said the Earth would explode. They said it was the end for us. They said that? Come on, let's go over to my office. You gotta believe me. Read it like an order, Bill. My what? office. I want Major Donaldson to look at you. The psychiatrist? Hank, you've got to listen Come to on me. Come over to the office. That's the story, Major Donaldson. I see. Well, Hank, you believe it, don't you? Well, Major, what do you think? I'm not sure. Uh, Bill, these men from Mars... I didn't say they were from Mars. Do you hear me say anything about men from Mars? No, you didn't. All I'm trying to tell you is this. Whoever those people were, they knew all about us, everything. And they warned me. Our atomic bombs are a danger to the universe. One more and we're going to be the... Juiciest galactic 4th of July of all time. Explode, finish, gone. Like that. How do you like it? All right, Bill, roll up your sleeve. Oh, now, forget it, Major. All I need is a couple of drinks. Sorry, Bill. Sorry. Not right now. Let the, let the Major give you a hypo. Now, look, I got a drink coming, a lot of drinks. Later. Come on, Bill, but... the sleeve. You heard him, Bill. All right, yes, all right, if it's an order. Go ahead. There. You'll be okay in a few hours. I'm okay now. Sure. We'll leave you here, Bill. It's all right if Bill sleeps in here, isn't it, Colonel? Sure. Yeah. Well, maybe you'll believe me tomorrow. You'd better. Come on, Major. He'll be okay by himself, Major. He's been under a strain, but he'll sleep a long time. Uh, you better explain it to his wife somehow. I'll talk to him tomorrow. Tough. I've heard he's one of the best. He's the best. A combination of nerve and loyalty and lightning reflexes that comes once in ten million times. What about it, Major? How does Bill look to you? I can't tell yet. Maybe a week, six months, six years. I'll need a whole lot of time with him before I can tell. I see. Well, we'd better get some sleep, too. All right. And don't worry, Colonel. He's a strong boy. Best nerves I've seen. I'd say things will be all right. Delusions like Bill's latched on to... Well, delusions like this... Major. Yes, Colonel? Major, when you make your charts for Bill, diagnose him and treat him and do all the things you have to, when you do that, Major, consider this. Yes? How did he keep that plane in the air for ten hours? For ten hours, Major, when he had fuel to last him only ten minutes. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight starred Frank Lovejoy in The Outer Limit by Graham Dore, adapted for radio by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Featured in the cast were Charles McGraw as the Colonel, Jeff Corey as Major Donaldson, Stan Waxman as Zeglon, and Ian Wolfe as Zill. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Actual flight details were authenticated by rocket test pilot Gene May, Sergeant Hartley Caldwell of the Air Force Section of the Armed Forces Public Information Office, and by the Douglas Aircraft Corporation. Next week... You were on the Baltic Sea within sight of the Soviet coast, where your Russian wife is secretly waiting to escape with you to England. And on the cold, dark waters behind you, an armed patrol boat is about to discover your small sailing craft. If it does, you will never escape. Next week, we escape with Roger Bax's thrilling and timely tale of a man and woman who dared to defy an entire government in order to be together, two if by sea. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. Two all-star bouts are promised on CBS this Wednesday night. Bing Crosby faces Fred Allen across the CBS mic to battle it out on who's funnier, singers or comedians. And in the second attraction, Gracie Allen and the Smash Thunder team up against not-so-gorgeous George Burns and a guilty conscience. This Wednesday also brings you Groucho Marx, his ad libs, On You Bet Your Life, and a Dr. Christian story about two redheads in love. 
Fun action variety. They all yours with Dr. Christian, Groucho Marx, Bing Crosby and Fred Allen, and George and Gracie on most of these same CBS stations Wednesday night. Now stay tuned for the adventures of Philip Marlowe, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, where you bet your life with Groucho Marx every Wednesday, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.